lovely, lovely imps. Today, we are having a react stream and we are reacting to a ContraPoints video, which is interesting because we don't do that very often on this stream. Even though we've talked about ContraPoints a lot, uh, because, you know, I tend to talk about the goings on on the internet, especially in the left-leaning political spaces. Um, and uh, this, today's, uh, uh, today's react is to a video that's going to be about JK Rowling and a bunch of other stuff. Now I've heard already on the grapevine in like the two hours since this video came out, um, that there's a lot of controversy going into this one, which is actually very interesting to me because that means it gives me lots to react to and lots to talk about. As you all know, I tend to be a bit of a pause Andrea. I tend to pause the video and talk about my thoughts about what the, what the person making the video is saying and give my own insights. So you can look forward to hearing a lot of thoughts and expanding upon things that are being said from me as we watch this video. But before we watch it, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the history of my community uh, and my channel and even myself with regards to the, the internet show ContraPoints. Um, I have been watching ContraPoints for a very long time. Um, since some of ContraPoints' earliest videos, uh, I've been watching that channel. Um, and I've always quite liked them. In fact, um, I found some of them like remarkably emotionally impactful. Uh, a lot of the things that ContraPoints' videos hand like discuss um, ha are really hard hitting stuff. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of, of just discussions about really serious emotional issues that tie into politics. And I've always appreciated that a lot. Um, I've also been pretty vocally a ContraPoints defender in a lot of circumstances because a lot of people get very, very angry at ContraPoints. And uh, while it is true that ContraPoints has had a lot of success, uh, um, like a lot, like one of the most successful trans YouTubers on the planet. Um, it's also true that there just aren't many trans YouTubers on the planet. So ContraPoints tends, in my opinion, to, to sort of become a, to, to be put into an impossible situation where no matter what uh, the video says, and no matter what claims are being made, there is going to be an incredible amount of expectations, uh, of anger, of emotion circling around these videos. And that's not always a strength. That's not always a good thing. Um, because uh, um, sometimes people are really, really unhealthy with their attachment to online creators. Um, one of the first YouTube videos I ever made was actually discussing uh, a really, really, really bad uh, bout of extremely toxic behavior being directed at ContraPoints years ago. Um, I've been streaming and making videos for a long time. At that time, I didn't make many videos, but I thought this was an important enough uh, like internet drama occurrence that I would talk about it. And it made me feel very sad at the time that so many people um, were willing to just be brutal to Natalie, the creator of the ContraPoint show, um, over what I think were genuine misunderstandings. Um, and it, 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 it made me sad and I was urging people to uh, be more careful. And I still believe that, I still stand by all of that. Um, those of you who watch my channel regularly, which if you don't watch my channel regularly, you should, because my channel is awesome and we talk about a lot of really cool stuff. You should smack the subscribe button down below and also don't forget to press like. That way you can catch more Demon Mama. Uh, but uh, you will know that I recently talked about another drama in which I feel like ContraPoints herself actually sort of stepped in uh, to the toxicity and helped drive a lot of that toxicity to somebody else uh, in a really unnecessary and, uh, in my opinion, kind of dirty way. So uh, while I have generally been a ContraPoints and Natalie defender on the large, because I do think people are very unfriendly, you all should know that I'm not above uh, critiquing uh, uh, 
ContraPoints, the show, and Natalie, the person, um, when it's necessary. And I just wanted to sort of get that out there so that people understand my history with the channel. I'm not some kind of like hater. I'm not like a super fan or anything like that. I have a pretty nuanced and complicated, uh, well, I guess not complicated, but a pretty nuanced, um, you know, approach to this whole thing. I really, really try to not uh, jump onto cancellation trains or anything like that. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we understand what we're going to be talking about here because this is a pretty, this video is a, a pretty major issue. It's discussing J.K. Rowling and the video is called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, which is a pretty uh, 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 provocative title. I also happen to know, uh, people have mentioned that there is some discussion of other dramas that ContraPoints has been involved in, which might be a, a source of drama. So we're going to talk about it, we're going to react to it, and we're going to watch this all together with an open mind. And I want to remind you, of course, that the imps, the Demon Mama fans, you all, the one rule, well, okay, we have the one rule. But we have a community rule, which is that imps raid with love, okay? Imps only raid with love. We don't do the hate brigading, okay? If you guys have criticisms that you can say reasonably, you're totally fine to do that. But we only raid with love, okay? So keep that in mind and remember that. So you guys see kind of the reason why I'm bringing this forward and, 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 and opening like this. Anyway, without any further ado, let's jump in directly into the new ContraPoints video, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. Here we go. We're going to watch this together. Now, it's a two-hour video, so we're in for a bit of a long haul. But don't worry. We're going to have a great time. And I am happy to be uh, hanging out with my imps and talking about this video. All right. Let's do it, everybody. Let's start it. Sar, I'm gonna talk about Joro once again, but first, story time. Chapter 1. Anita. The most famous bigot in American LGBT history is a woman called Anita Bryant. This is her story. 1977 was not a good time to be gay. Is it ever uh, really- Let me get the, uh, oh no, there's no closed captions. We don't got no captions, everybody. We're gonna have to deal with no captions. A good time to be gay. In 1969, the Stonewall Riots forced gay rights into national consciousness. The first Pride Parades were held in the summer of 1970, and in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association declassified homosexuality as a mental disorder. But only after gay activists disrupted their conference and shouted, GAY CONVERSION THERAPY IS TORTURE! WE HAVE ABNORMAL URGES, AND WE WILL NOT BE SILENCED! It is true that gay conversion therapy is torture. Because that's the only way to get anything done in this country. You have to be super annoying about it. They give you no choice. On January 18th, 1977, Dade County, Florida, known for such popular cities as Miami, approved a law that added the phrase affectional or sexual preference to its non-discrimination ordinance, effectively banning housing and employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And it was just then as things seemed to be getting better, that Anita Bryant made her little appearance. Anita Bryant, Miss Oklahoma! Anita Bryant is a native Oklahoman who once had a career as a pop singer, beauty queen, and spokeswoman for the Florida Citrus Commission. Come to the Florida sunshine tree. My twins love 100% orange juice from Florida anytime of the day. Orange juice from Florida! Florida! I, I... I love the the very this is totally random and totally in, disconnected from the content uh, But I love the way that so many different people say Florida some people say Florida Some people say Florida. It's great. There's so much. There's, there's just so much variety for such a Terrible place. I'm sorry. There's a lot of natural beauty in Florida. I, I used to actually spend uh, my my, my one part of my family, a big chunk of my family is from Florida. So I used to spend like all of the summers of my high school years 
down in Florida, and I actually quite liked it. I have a lot of good memories of the natural environment, with one exception. Some of you will know of the horrible camping trip that I had. Uh, it's called Hell Island. I won't get into it now. Uh, so I'm not trying to shit on like the natural beauty of Florida. Uh, but let's just say Florida politically is not a very fun place to be now or really ever. Let's continue. It isn't just for breakfast anymore. Orange juice with natural vitamin C from the Florida sunshine tree. She was known for these TV commercials with the tagline, A day without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. Breakfast without orange juice is like a day without sunshine. Cute. When Anita heard her pastor speak about this non-discrimination ordinance, she felt a divine disturbance in her heart. How touching. According to the word of God, it's an abomination uh, to practice homosexuality. As a mother, she would not stand for this. So Anita wrote a letter to the county commissioner saying, As a concerned mother of four children, I am most definitely against this ordinance amendment. I have never condoned nor taught my children discrimination against anyone. But if this ordinance amendment is allowed to become law, you will, in fact, be infringing upon my rights and discriminating against me as a citizen and a mother to teach my children God's moral code as stated in the Holy Scriptures. Anita. I always say this. I've been harping on this a lot lately. But conservative Christians are the most annoying people on the planet. They literally believe that anybody who's different than them is an infringement on their rights. I'm not kidding you. They actually believe that they have a right, that it is their God-given right to exist on a Christian planet. It, they, they will dress it up in legalistic language, but at the end of the day, that is what they believe. They think that it's offensive to their core, that it is an attack on their basic rights, that anyone thinks differently than them on the entire planet. They genuinely believe that. It's so insufferable. It's so unworkable. And it is very annoying. That's the thing. That's the one thing that gives me hope is that people like this annoy the hell out of everyone else. It's not, they don't keep in mind, they, they, they fixate on gay people, but they don't just do this to gay people. Uh, as, as a small anecdote, um, there were members of my family who would uh, freak out if somebody was watching The Office in their presence. I'm, I'm not kidding you. There were members of my family when I grew up in a very, very uh, extreme Christian environment. Um, I have a video on it. I grew up in a cult um, and I got out of it, thankfully, obviously. Um, but there were people who would get actually like seriously offended. Like they would g get mad at you and call you out on it if you happen to turn the office on uh, and watch it in their presence. Just that level of, 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 of just insufferability. Just wild. Yes, the office. Because of Oscar? No, because of all kinds of things. They, uh, depictions of drinking alcohol, uh, raunchy jokes, uh, a gay character that's that's uh, portrayed positively. Um, you know, uh, none of the characters are Christians. They have 110 reasons for why The Office was offensive. Um, and of course, I grew up with extreme restrictions on my media consumption. I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of cartoons um, because they were, you know, too too edgy or something. It was, it's deranged. The, of course, they always end up, it always ends up hurting people like gay people the most because and trans people now, because that's what they have to fixate on to get the most attention and sympathy. But it, it goes far beyond that. They can't even enjoy a TV show. Uh, kill your shitty child. When the amendment passed, Anita created a campaign for its repeal, the Save Our Children Coalition, which sponsored provocative TV ads implying that gay people are degenerates who ruin communities and seduce children. The campaign has been vicious. With television commercials, the Save Our Children group is appealing to parental anxieties, saying gays will flaunt their homosexuality before impressionable children. The Orange Bowl Parade, Miami's doesn't this sound like this is literally word for word what's going on right now. Nothing has changed. The conservatives in America haven't changed at all. They just fixate on trans people now instead of gay people for now.
It's the exact same fucking words. Gift to the nation, wholesome entertainment. But in San Francisco, when they take to the streets, it's a parade of homosexuals, men hugging other men, cavorting with little boys. Save Our Children sparked the first organized backlash to gay rights in the United States, escalating the conflict into a national controversy. On one side were the gay rights activists, who argued that non-discrimination was a matter of human rights. On the opposing side, Anita Bryant argued that the non-discrimination ordinance would give special privileges to homosexuals. As long as they don't want to flaunt their homosexuality, they have equal rights the same as anyone else. In other words, gay people... Of course, you know, I'm sure ContraPoints is going to address this, but of course it's always hilarious that they say flaunt their homosexuality when these people wear their Christian necklaces out, while these people have their literal, uh, their, their marriage bands on their fingers, they, they walk with their whole family, they, they, they paste their crap, their heterosexual crap all over media, they constantly bombard the entirety of society with a message that you must reproduce for the good of the nation. Uh, yeah, talk about fucking flaunting it. Let's go. Literal, I know that people, people make jokes about, about, uh, the, the rings thing, but I want you to understand, if you didn't grow up in, in Christianity and, like, in a, a, a fundamental, Christians actually believe that they're ownership rings. That is the whole point of marriage. Men have dominion over their wives in Christianity. It is very explicit. There is no... A, a, a wedding ring in the Christian tradition is the exact same thing as a BDSM collar, uh, except uh, with less consent involved. Let's continue. People already have equal rights, just as long as they stay in the closet and don't do anything gay. That's very helpful. Thank you so much, Anita, for standing up for our right to be gay in secret. <laughs> Anita also argued that allowing flaunting homosexuals to teach children was tan- Yeah, it's funny too because modern conservatives will claim the same thing when accounts like, uh, when, when social media hubs like uh, t libs of TikTok, their entire job is to go after queer people's jobs all the time, every day, all day, every day. And then they'll just be, people like Tucker Carlson and Matt Walsh will be like, we don't want to hurt anybody. We just tacitly and openly uh, support accounts that allow people to be directly harassed and have them get fired all the time and also have terrorist acts done against them. It amount to gay recruitment. is the exact same argument that's being used today by right-wing politicians who claim that queer people are groomers. Stop confusing our babies with your groomer gender ideologue. This wicked book, me and Earl and the dying girl, sexually indoctrinated with wicked, vile books. And she believes in traditional marriage between a man and a woman, and in that book it talked about two moms. Stay away from the children creep or you will regret it. People should definitely arm themselves, I agree with that. The Democrats are the party of pedophiles. The Democrats are the party of, of teachers, uh, elementary school teachers trying to trying to transition their elementary school age children and convince them they're a different gender. They're just evil people and they want wow. to groom kids. Yeah. They're recruiting. My, if you don't know what furries are, it's where school children dress up as animals, cats or dogs, during the school day. They meow and they bark. What a great country we live in. I love it so much. Gay people around the country rallied against Anita Bryant and Save Our Children. There was a national boycott of Florida orange juice, with many gay bars taking screwdrivers off the menu and replacing them with an apple juice and vodka cocktail called an Anita Bryant. Let's make one now. Forgot my cocktail measure, so I'm just gonna have to eyeball this.
introduced a dash of apple juice. Give it a stir. <coughs> Needs a garnish. Stunning. I mean, it's not as good as a screwdriver, but if I was in the 70s, I would have thrown back so many of these goddamn things out of pure spite. There's a story that Troy Perry, the founder of the gay affirming metropolitan community church, was on a transcontinental flight. And when the attendant put a glass of orange juice on his tray, he said, take that away. I'm a homosexual. At gay pride marches in 1977 and 78, anti-Anita Bryant slogans featured prominently on t-shirts, signs, and buttons. Anita Bryant sucks oranges. A day without lesbians is like a day without sunshine. True. And meanwhile, Anita's campaign inspired more- <laughs> Fucking true though. More anti-gay legislation, including bans on gay adoption and same-sex marriage, both of which passed in the Florida Senate, as well as the failed Briggs Initiative in California, which would have forced public schools to fire gay teachers. So Anita Bryant was worse than a bigot. She was an influential bigot, but she may also have helped to unify and galvanize gay activists by providing them with a common enemy. According to historian Lillian Faderman, Anita Bryant created fervent activists out of those who'd previously been content simply to enjoy their newfound freedoms. Faderman cites Eric mm. Hoffer's observation that a mass movement can get along fine without a god, but it won't get along at all without a devil. For gay people all over the country, mm. Anita Bryant became that devil. I think that uh, she is rallying the community together like I have never seen before. There's no way I could have done it on my own. So even though she succeeded in her initial goal to repeal the non-discrimination ordinance, there is no question that in the long term, Anita Bryant was the loser. She took a lot of L's. Rip. That must be super hard for her. For the short remainder of her career, gay activists protested her events. They shut down the tour for her book about how persecuted she was by the militant homosexual, and they succeeded in turning public opinion against Anita Bryant to the point that she became virtually unemployable in mainstream entertainment. And it helped- Yes. Helped that she came across as kind of a judgmental prude that even hip straight people didn't want to be associated with. Yeah, that's the thing I'm talking about, by the way. And and I think that there's actually a lot of truth to that part. Like, you guys know, I, I literally was just talking about that a few minutes ago about how annoying these people are. That normie people, even people who aren't like super jazzed about gay rights, get friggin' annoyed by these people, obviously. They're, they're annoying, they're horrible to be around, they're insufferable. Our top story tonight, Anita Bryant, former mediocre actress and orange juice promoter, <laughs> performed coitus in public yesterday and <laughs> campaigned to promote heterosexuality. We don't serve orange juice anymore. Like she famously told Playboy magazine. Why do you think the homosexuals are called fruits? It's because they eat the forbidden fruit of the tree of life. <laughs> God referred to me. <laughs> come on. Come on. <laughs> what? Men as trees, and because the homosexuals eat the forbidden fruit, which is male sperm. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> okay, but you guys, you guys, you guys, you know that that comes that like that that could be from a Matt Walsh video. Okay, that could be from a Nick Fuentes stream. These people talk the same way. Oh my God, like the woman is heterosexual cringe. This is how you lose the culture war. So let's all squeeze a fruit for Anita. Pass a little juice around. And of course, there was the famous incident where a gay activist smashed a banana cream pie in Anita's face during a TV appearance. And went into a place called Norfolk, Virginia, and were met with protest and uh, um, all kinds of problems. And uh, uh, every oh. <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so beautiful. Nothing is better. Oh, God. It's so good. It's so beautiful. No, no, let him stay. No. Let him stay. Well, at least stay. it's a fruit pie. Miami-Dade County finally reinstated the non-discrimination ordinance in 1998, and they added gender identity to its protections in 2014. In 2021, Anita took another metaphorical pie to the face when her granddaughter, Sarah Green, came out as gay, announcing her marriage to a woman and publicly struggling with whether to even invite her grandmother to the ceremony. It's very hard to argue with someone who thinks that like a, an integral part of your identity is just 
uh, an evil delusion. <laughs> that it is, Sarah. That it is. So that's the story of Anita Bryant as students of LGBT history know it. But isn't it a bit one-sided? Wasn't there a lot of toxicity on both sides? The Anita Bryant forces talk of absolute truth and morality. Gay leaders are equally dogmatic about human rights. A plague on both the houses. Isn't it cruel even to slur Anita as a bigot and a homophobe? In fact, isn't it possible that Anita Bryant was the real victim? <laughs> oh no. Oh no! <laughs> Ah, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I'm eating my pie. I'm eating my goddamn pie. Chapter two, the witch trials of Anita Bryant. God help us all. The mainstream media would have us believe that Anita Bryant is a so-called homophobe, some kind of hateful bigot. But isn't this just an authoritarian tactic used to silence valid concerns? Mothers in this country are worried about their children going to school to be taught by perverts. How can we be so sure? Remember everyone, all insults are exactly the same. All words are the same. Words don't matter except for when they do, when it's convenient for the baddest people on the planet to get their way. And uh, the, it, saying somebody is being prejudiced is the same thing as them calling for your eradication. These are all the same thing as we all very seriously acknowledge, of course. Or that the militant homosexuals weren't the real bigots. Isn't it possible that Anita Bryant was the first victim of cancel culture, of, dare I say it, wokeism? Well, no, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. But suppose that you're an idiot, and suppose that that's the narrative you wanted to promote. Well, what would be your argument? I mean, if someone put a gun to my head and forced me to make that argument, I'd probably say something like this. Anita Bryant lived a difficult life. In 1940, she was born into brutal poverty in rural Oklahoma. Her parents divorced when she was just two years old, the same year she made her singing debut at the Baptist Church. Parts of my childhood, I blocked out because it hurts too much. I guess I was happiest when I was eight years old, and my parents were remarried, and I was baptized and came to know Christ as my personal savior. Her father abandoned the family again when she was 12. Why does, why does Anita Bryant have the same talking pattern, like speech pattern, as Ron DeSantis? Am I, am I off? That just like struck me as like pitch shifted Ron, is it the, is it the, is it the Florida connection? Is that it? Is it that? But she wasn't born in Florida. It was real painful, and it just about killed my mother. She was a very submissive wife. She was too submissive, and it angered me. She let my dad step all over her. Because of him, I think I went through life for a long time hating all men. Anita described her most intense adolescent memory as a feeling of intense ambition. A relentless drive to succeed at doing well the thing I loved. Glory, glory, But Anita's ambition conflicted with her submissive role as a traditional Christian woman. In 1960, Anita married Bob Green, Miami's top disc jockey. Ain't that always the case? Every single one of these reactionary women always run into the same problem. The lifelong albatross around their neck. Ah, I'm a guy believe in God and God tells me that I'm supposed to be a literal doormat. Whoops. The only after he relentlessly badgered her into it. This is what heterosexuals do, fellas. <laughs> oh, I'm going to vomit. I'm going to be sick. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to throw up. Green was allegedly a controlling and abusive husband. Feminist Andrea Dworkin claims, Green manipulated Bryant with a cruelty nearly unmatched in modern love stories. And Anita rationalized the abuse, saying, Despite our sometimes violent scraps, I love him for it. But why?
While submitting to her husband and raising four children, Anita was still able to build the career she'd always wanted. By the 1970s, she was on the payroll of Big Orange Juice, earning half a million dollars a year, enough to move her family into a 27-room Spanish mansion on Biscayne Bay. So <laughs> what? Okay, I'm sorry. The 27 room, okay, all right, I can't pause this much, but seriously, holy moly, 27 rooms? Well, I guess it gives you a lot of rooms to hide in when the violent scraps begin. Anita Bryant struggled all her life for her success. Did she really deserve to lose it all just because she took a stand for something she believed in? Anita Bryant's role as a leader in the campaign against homosexuals may be hurting her campaign to sell orange juice. Are you being blackballed? Well, it's, uh, it's, it looks that way. It's, it's worse than that. We're being threatened and uh, there's all kinds of harassment even with my job with Florida Citrus. Sound familiar? Like literally word for word? Her entire life had become a series of catastrophes. She'd been dropped as spokesperson by the orange growers. She'd been dropped as a commentator on the Orange Bowl parade. She lost a television show contract. Her bookings dropped drastically. No one has paid as dearly as Nita Bryant for taking a public stand on something she believed in. I remember lying. <laughs> okay, unintentional comedy to say she, no one has paid as dearly as Anita Bryant and just showing her with a pie on her face. Oh, oh, the humanity. Oh, God, you got a pie. No, not a pie. In the bed in my my mother's house in a fetal position and wanting to die. Gay activists in the 1970s didn't exactly limit their tactics to polite debate in the free marketplace of ideas. Homosexuals started fighting back. The gays formed new groups and picketed the performer's public appearances, forcing her to cancel a few. Gay activists routinely compared Anita to Adolf H. They created pastiches of her orange juice slogan. They blamed her for hate crimes. They burned her in effigy. They disrupted events she was involved Good. in. They printed toilet paper with her face on it. Some sent Anita death threats, or they mailed her rotting oranges, dead cockroaches, human excrement. See, this is how you canceled people before phones. Instead of shit posting, you would simply mail actual human shit through the United States Postal Service. Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night. <laughs> Anita's husband pleaded to supporters. How would you men feel if you opened a letter and there was a- Demon Mama Industries must issue the following statement. We do, not, we do not support here the mailing of human excrement through the United States Postal Service. In fact, this may be in violation of multiple state laws and or federal laws. Please, on behalf of Demon Mama Industries, do not mail your shit through the mail. Please find more creative and more useful ways uh, to fight back against bigots. This has been a formal statement from Demon Mama Productions. Thank you very much. The photo of your wife's head superimposed on some other female nude body in the most lewd and shocking sexual act you can imagine. You can imagine quite a lot. I do think it would be fair to say that a lot of the rhetoric did take on a misogynistic tone. Lillian Faderman recounts that lesbians, particularly lesbian feminists, abhorred the sex- Listen, listen. People, people only had so many options before the pig poop balls uh, image existed, okay? They had to make do. We lived in a dark time before pig poop balls was a possibility, okay? By the way, if you're having fun, smack that like button and don't forget to subscribe to Demon Mama. Uh, as you can see, I try to add a lot of stuff to my reactions and I'm sure we're going to have a lot to talk about as this video goes on. Uh, Happy to have you here, uh, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching this on YouTube in the future. Thanks for being here. ...terms that were being used to characterize Anita Bryant. 
bitch and whore, gay men called her. The harassment escalated to the point where Anita had to cancel her book tour due to demonstrations and bomb threats from gay activists. And of course, there was the pie. So much for the tolerant Mattachine society. It's kind of a deep cut. Well, something to entertain the boomer queers. Gay activists claimed to stand for human rights, but what about Anita's right to free speech? I wish I had some literal pearls to clutch. Civil libertarian Nat Hentoff wrote in his 1992 book, Free Speech for Me, But Not for Thee, that the orange juice boycott reminded him of a little thing called McCarthyism. Have you ever considered that being pro-gay is quite similar to being anti-gay, and that both are opinions? As Anita tells it, she and her We've been trapped in a time loop forever. It's the same thing. We are trapped in a time loop. Wake up, wake up. You're trapped in a time loop, wake up. Foot soldiers of God were the victims of sinister gay carpetbaggers. The foot soldiers were housewives and mothers, religious and civic leaders in opposition to a well-organized, highly financed, and politically militant group of homosexual activists. We were cast as bigots, haters, discriminators, and deniers of basic human rights. And all of this happened True. because we were sincerely concerned for our children and our community. So Anita's version of the story is that she and a handful of well-intentioned Christian mothers were cast as bigots by a highly funded mafia of gay extremists, all because they had a few teensy tiny concerns about the militant homosexual cavorting with little boys. Cavorting with little boys. Is it really fair to call this woman a bigot? Until the Dade County Ordinance, Anita was a registered Democrat and considered herself a liberal. And she never said that she hated gay people or wanted them dead. In fact, she even said that she loves homosexuals. I love homosexuals, if you can believe that. I love them enough to tell them the truth because I know that there is hope for the homosexuals that if they're willing to... We have, we've, we have literally watched Matt Walsh say that exact same thing. Uh, turn from uh, sin the same as any individual, that, uh, that they can be ex-homosexuals the same as there can be an ex-murderer, an ex-thief, or ex-anybody. She loves homosexuals because they can change, just like murderers. Would a bigot have said that? <laughs> just about McFucking had it. Anita was so kind-hearted, she even said that she related to the homosexual. I can relate to the homosexual because I've had emotional scars in my own life. I really felt the rejection of my father, and that is one of the things that maybe leads someone going into homosexuality. Look, I don't hate homosexuals. That's the truth. Look, I don't care if you call me a homosexual as long as you call me a winner. I can't stop hearing it. I can't. I can't stop. It's, it's, it's female. I can't. I can't escape it. It's rotting my brain. No matter what they think of my motives, I've always said I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. Wow. What an empath. She's meatballing. You know, I actually think it's really noble how she's able to project all of her I'm own sorry. emotional I'm baggage so onto the marginalized group whose rights she's trying to take away. Okay. So we've given a fair hearing to both sides, to many sides. We've considered all the evidence. Now, let's suppose there's no longer a gun to my head and ask, did Anita Bryant really deserve that pie to the face? Well, yes, obviously. Look, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's possible to take genuine virtues like nuance, empathy, and impartiality, and to twist them into fucked up apologia for horrible oppressive behavior. If you play this game long enough, you can essentially explain away the entire concept of bigotry and conclude that, in reality, there are no bigots. There's only tragically misunderstood people with difficult childhoods and valid concerns cruelly demonized by militant activists defaming and silencing them with such reputation-ruining slurs as homophobe. Now, because you, viewers, are smart, media literate people, you understand framing. So you already know that I'm about to compare Anita Bryant to JK Rowling. In case you didn't know... Based and true-pilled. JK Rowling... Uh, JK Rowling is a popular author 
who used to write whimsical stories about wizard school, but who now writes books about transvestite serial killers masturbating into stolen panties because she's lost her goddamn mind. Lo ho ho, dear readers. <sighs> Christ, what a nightmare. Chapter three, The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. All right, kids. It's trans in time. Last year, I agreed to be a guest on a podcast about J.K. Rowling, hosted by Megan Phelps Roper, an escapee from the Westboro Baptist Church, the notorious hate group from Topeka, Kansas, most known for protesting the funerals of soldiers with signs that say God hates f God and me both. I'm tired of you people. JK Illy. The Westboro Baptist Church is one of the most famous homophobic hate groups in the world. In a way, I'm like a lifelong fan of these people. I've watched all the Louis Theroux documentaries. I went to a counter- Unironically though, the Louis Theroux documentaries on Westboro Baptist, if you are in the audience and you haven't seen those, they are phenomenal. They're so good. And in fact, basically every single thing that Louis Thoreau has ever touched is gold. And I mean that like comes with my glowing recommendation. There is not a single Louis Thoreau special that I haven't enjoyed, including his much lower uh, budget show called Weird Weekends with Louis, with Louis Thoreau. And they are incredible. Absolutely amazing. He goes and meets UFO people. He goes and meets uh, weird Nazi militias in the woods. He goes and meets um, mountain men. He goes and meets psychics. He meets porn stars. It's so cool. And he just somehow makes it the coolest and funniest thing that you've ever seen. If you haven't seen any of Louis Thoreau stuff, you need to go watch it right now. Just, just saying. I'm sure you all have, but just in case protest in 2010. I remember how when I was in high school- I also don't know how to say his name correctly. So please forgive me. Cool. The Westboro Baptist Church was like the one thing that conservatives and liberals could agree on because they hated the troops and the gays. Essentially the two genders of 2006. But let's not pretend that the Westboro Baptist Church is all bad. Okay, when Megan was at Westboro, she used to do these amazing Lady Gaga parodies about how the gays are going to hell, which to this day, I am a big fan of. But what did you say you th I love your brain. He hates all you do cause you love fornicating. Love fornicating. <laughs> it's perfect. I love it. Play it at my funeral. Stop praying, stop praying. God will not hear you anymore. You've got the boys and the girls to be proud for. For forever burn. Go to the spawn. You just keep pushing on to the hell we forever burn. Megan left the West. Oh my God. Christian parodies are so painful. They're so painful. Now I just want to listen to actually good Christian, like wholesomely good Christian music like B-Shock. Baptist Church in 2012 after a crisis of faith precipitated by a power struggle within the church. She wrote about all this in her book Unfollow, which is honestly a pretty interesting account of deconversion and the circumstances that lead someone to leaving a hate group. Megan contacted me for her podcast because I had criticized J.K. Rowling in a video a couple years ago. Now you may be wondering, why would I think that a person who's been carrying a God hates sign most of her life would be the correct person to lead an international conversation about the intricacies of LGBT issues. Because I'm an idiot. Happy? Basically, I agreed to the podcast because it's a pretty irresistible pitch. A former member of the Westboro Baptist Church wants to mediate a conversation between me and the author of Harry Potter. Would you say no to that? Maybe. If you're smart. Last month, the podcast was announced in an essay by Megan titled The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. Obviously a tendentious framing that posits Joe Rowe as the target of an irrational trans witch hunt. The essay included a teaser quote from Rowling complaining that she's been profoundly misunderstood, as well as a photo of an angry trans mob holding a rotten hell Rowling sign. They don't look angry. They look chill. Why are Americans okay? Listen, I'm sorry, but I gotta be. I gotta be completely honest. Americans and British people are both like they're from the same 
like spiritual breed, okay? Which is their souls are weak and they're scared by even the most friendly looking crowd of people. If you are holding a sign, they like, it's just like, I don't know what it is. What the hell's wrong with people? Are, are you truly that scared of like a crowd of people? This is the country where everyone's like, my first amendment right means freedom of speech. And they're like, literally, and then somebody holds up a sign. They're like, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. I give up. Take my family. So fucking pathetic. Juxtaposed with an image of sorry. conservative I'm Christians sorry. I'm burning Harry sorry, I'm Potter sorry. books in the early 2000s. This did not bode well. So I disavowed the podcast on Twitter because I didn't want my name lending legitimacy to some kind of unearned JK Rowling redemption tour. This caused Megan's mom, Shirley, to quote tweet me, calling me a bigot against God. I mean, God is one of the most vulnerable minorities. There's only one of him. And he could really use your help, Shirley. I said in these tweets that I felt used, which that is how I felt, but ultimately, I need to take full responsibility for my involvement in this. The thing about being a guest on a documentary like this is you honestly have no idea what the final product is gonna be like. So the decision to participate is always a leap of faith. And I can't really say that Megan misled me. There were red flags from the beginning and I ignored them because I was projecting my own hopes onto the situation. You know, it's a compelling story. I liked the idea that this famous former bigot could talk some sense into a famous current bigot. We all love a good redemption arc. And I started my career de-radicalizing the alt-right. That's something I've moved away from. I, I think making a mistake like this is a, a very forgivable thing. But also, like, it's tragic for the same reason that I mentioned at the beginning of this stream. Remember how I talked about how like ContraPoints is basically given in the public no margin of error? Like, like Natalie can't make, like in the minds of people, in the minds of the mindless mass, uh, Natalie being one of the most famous trans content creators in the world means there's like, oh, what the hell's going on there? Whoa, that was weird. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that was really weird. My. My audio just messed up. Apologies about that. Uh, but but Natalie is basically not able to make any mistake whatsoever, at least in the minds of the uh, of the of the public. Like none. And even though this is a completely understandable mistake to make, it's a simple miscalculation of of the direction that a message will go. And keep in mind that like people way more famous and in positions of way more power than contrapoints. Um, have made similar mistakes. Do you know how many famous people have accidentally ended up in documentaries that are like uh, going against what they believe in? In fact, there was like re relatively recently a uh, a bunch of physicists, like a bunch of like world famous physicists got tricked into a, uh, I think it was a flat earth documentary. Um, yeah, it like it happens. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not, or geocentrism, sorry, geocentrism, not a flat earth. Or was it flat earth? Okay, I'm getting mixed messages. I could have, I could have sworn it was flat earth. But, um, yeah, I have no idea how I ended up in that stupid geocentrism documentary. Yeah, this is by Lawrence Krauss. Like, Lawrence Krauss actually had to write like a denouncement about it. So this thing, this sort of thing can happen. And while you might be able to say, sure, there were red flags, I do wish it was it was more possible for, uh, for people to, for like the crowd as a whole to be a little bit more forgiving. But it also kind of makes sense why it's not the case, right? Like not to try and not to try and be like a reasonable Andy here, but like the stakes are pretty high for trans people right now. Um, and also, there just aren't many trans people who actually do have a platform like Natalie's. So it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough position to be in. Um, and I understand why people, uh, feel, uh, uh, that you, that like, if you have a platform of that size, that you need to be responsible. And of course, on the flip side, the platform isn't even that big, okay? 
Just remember that as far as large platforms go, ContraPoint's platform is very big relatively, but on the scale of the world, not that big. So just keep these things in mind as we're watching this. Niana says, it's the, the powerless people will always take swings at those they can actually hurt issue. Well, they won't always, but yes, a lot of people will because they don't obviously, uh, 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 most trans people in America don't have any path to reaching anybody. They're being actively uh, stigmatized. They're being actively genocided by a deranged uh, party of lunatics um, at, who are religious extremists by and large. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, let's continue. I didn't want to make this too big of a thing, but yeah, let's go. Um, but there's still part of me that wants to see the best in people and to believe that people can change if you just talk to them and make a good enough argument. <sighs> Maybe my wishful thinking was that because Megan left Westboro, that must mean that she must understand the intricacies of anti-LGBT bigotry, right? And despite no evidence for this, my hope was that Megan would act as a trans ally and could be really effective at confronting Joro about all the transphobic stuff she says, right? Wrong. I'm Megan Phelps Roper, and these are the Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling is more than seven hours of apologetics for J.K.R. The podcast presents Rowling as a complex, humane, heroic figure with an inspiring feminist backstory. Joe Rowling's rise to success is this sort of feminist Cinderella story. Now cruelly besieged by a vicious mob of transgender activists, all because she, as a woman, had a few tiny concerns about the transgender rapists. I had been becoming increasingly concerned about the way in which women were being shut down. Women who I felt had some very valid concerns. Megan uncritically accepts Rowling's framing of the conflict as feminists versus trans rights activists. Who also, just a small note, any time that these bigots say things like valid concerns, just remember, just remember the, uh, uh, that, that JK Rowling was freaking out about trans people being in women's prisons. And there was a grand total of like six trans people actually imprisoned in those, in those prisons at the time of that, like six, I think was the final number after you controlled for people who weren't actually in those prisons anymore and people who had been released or who had uh, completely different charges and been moved to different facilities. It's, it's, the, the statistics are so, it's so off that they're, the idea that these concerns are valid is, it's like, uh, they're, they're, the, the, the way they present it versus what the reality is, is astronomical, astro fucking nomical, okay? They would have you believe that there are like millions of trans people inside women's prisons. And also, of course, the other part, uh, the, the other irony is that they never fucking care about prisoners' rights any other time of the day. The only time they ever care about what's going on in a prison is when they can use it as a wedge issue to forward bigotry. Let's continue. Whom Rowling describes as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement. For the first five hours of this podcast, Rowling's critics are presented as an irrational mob of enraged, shrieking, sexually violent fanatics. You are murdering trans children! Let's get up our time! A huge amount of, I want her to choke on my fat trans dick. And you did it at my birthday dinner. There's this one clip of some kind of Antifa super soldiers abrasive <laughs> screaming. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my God. In Matt, oh my God, how can you? Oh.
getting getting mad at random Twitter users telling you to choke on their dick is literally like getting mad at someone saying fuck you. Okay? The same type of people who would be like, fuck you, that's sexual harassment! It, it is, oh God, okay. Just pathetic, just pathetic. Let's continue. That they play like once per episode. Fuck you, you ugly piece of shit! You look like you got your teeth knocked out, you fucking fascist! Nobody knows who you are, and nobody cares, and you will die alone! And then it usually cuts to like somber monks chanting some kind of medieval lament. You will die alone, and you will burn in hell! Just in case you didn't get from the title that this is a witch hunt. Do you guys get it? Do you get it yet? You got your teeth knocked out, you fucking fascist! Get out my town! And then these mobs of irrational, misogynistic, trans rights fanatics are contrasted with this poignant story of how J.K. Rowling escaped her abusive husband to publish our generation's most beloved novels. I was still very committed to those parts that I'd plotted in darkness, as it were, because there was a truth to them. Do you think she was talking about the part of her story where she wrote about how uh, wizards and witches had to teleport their poop away for most of the history of the world because only muggles invented toilets? Is that the part she was talking about, do you think? I feel like that's probably the, the, the part she was talking about because it, it would be hard, right? It would be pretty hard. Oh, or maybe she was... Um, Maybe she was talking about the, sh the like, repeated incidents of uh, sheep fucking in her story. Maybe that was it. Or, oh yeah, maybe it was the elf slaves. And there was a power to them. The only voices of genuine trans descent appear in episode six out of seven, more than five hours in. And there's only two of us. One is me, shame. And the other is a teenager named Noah who, kind of just seems like he wants to be liked and understood and wishes that his favorite author would please stop saying bigoted things about him. I'm such a big Harry Potter fan, or I was such a big Harry Potter fan, especially because it was so hard to be in the real world. I can't even state how important it was to me. J.K. Rowling, I stole her biography from my third grade classroom and I kept it for a long time because I just loved reading it because I just admired her so much. It's honestly... That's, that's so unfortunate. Pretty heartbreaking to listen to. On my last day editing this video, I got in touch with Noah. I asked him if he had any thoughts about the podcast he wanted me to pass along, and this is what he said. I want to emphasize that the stakes of this issue are very different from any sort of rhetorical debate. Conversation, dialogue, and debate are important, but for many of the most vulnerable people in society, the outcome of this conversation dictates their health, well-being, and ability to survive. How we treat- That was what I was saying. That's what I was trying to get at. And of course, Noah's saying it better here. Or talk to people like J.K. Rowling should come second to fighting for maintained access to health care, support, and general resources for children and adolescents seeking gender care. I Thanks, agree. Noah. The most frustrating thing about this podcast is that it refuses to be honest about what it is. They spend seven hours implying that J.K. Rowling is the victim of a witch hunt in the most heavy-handed way imaginable. These are the witch trials of J.K. Rowling. I mean, turf is basically witch. <gasps> but if you point this out, they just deny it. Show me the actual words, Chuck. Show me where I said I'm the victim of a witch hunt by trans people. You're on a podcast called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. Yes, a podcast on which I never once say I'm a victim of a witch hunt by trans people. What are you talking about? I'm not scamming the government, if that's what you're saying. Your license plate says scamming. Uh... <laughs> uh no. What do you mean, no? Yes. Joanne. 
Show me where I ever said that I'm the target of a witch hunt, you liar. Why would you even think that? You're crazy. By the way, come get your This Witch Doesn't Burn t-shirt for sale now at Wild Womine Workshop. And Megan is not much better. Like there's this whole section in episode two where Megan interviews Christians who burned Harry Potter books in the 1990s. And this is obviously meant to be foreshadowing. So my church did that. My church had a uh, had a Harry Potter burning book burning. So looking back, would you say that the Christian parents were maybe part of a moral panic? Yeah, absolutely. It's a scary world out there. Megan doesn't explicitly say she thinks trans protests against Joe Rowe are equivalent to the Christian ones in the 90s, but she does heavily imply it. There was an explosive reaction to Rowling's tweets, which led many including lifelong fans of her work, to condemn her and to call for her books to be banned, boycotted, and in some cases, burned. When confronted about the obvious implications of the podcast's title, Megan said, the title is ambiguous. Toward the end of our conversations, I spent a long time talking with JK Rowling about discernment, about how a person can ever know if they're standing up for what's right, or joining a moral panic. I think you'll be surprised by the thoughts she shares. Megan, I was not surprised. Just, just watch the seven hours of podcast to find out. I know I won't ever regret having stood up on this issue, ever. The podcast released new episodes weekly, and whenever Megan was challenged about the blatant one-sidedness, Megan would respond, Oh, you just think that because you haven't listened to the whole podcast yet. Maybe you should preserve judgment. Much more of other perspectives is coming. Make sure to tune in next week. More bombshell revelations to come. Well, I've listened to the whole podcast now, and I truly do not think that anyone with basic media comprehension Von Tux with the incredibly generous uh, $5. I lived near two Calvary chapels growing up. Apparently I needed to be more scared of them than I was. Book burning, that's Southern crazy church stuff. Oh no, that's their thing. Not every single Calvary chapel, uh, by the way, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier in the video, but I'll reiterate. I grew up in a very extreme fundamentalist cult, uh, which belonged to the Calvary chapel brand of churches. Um, no, they're very, very extreme. Now, some of their offshoot churches don't get that crazy because they're just trying to establish themselves in the area. But the large, uh, like central churches that have large influence are absolutely that crazy. They absolutely love that stuff. Oh yeah. And as you can see in the chat right over there, there is a, uh, link to my spiritual deconstruction video, which by the way, I am going to be remaking and updating very soon. My spiritual deconstruction is talking about my experience growing up in and then leaving and then thriving beyond the cult that I grew up in. Um, but yes, uh, Calvary Chapel is a very extreme church and they absolutely participate in stuff like that and more. They're highly politically involved. They organize very, very tightly with Republican groups. Uh, they, they drive funding towards Republican elections. They drive protests like crazy when it's a major issue they care about. So yeah, they're wild. Let's continue. Expansion skills could come away from this thinking that the main intent was anything other than to portray J.K. Rowling as the martyr of an unjust, uh, what's the word? Witch hunt? This is the obvious implication of the podcast from the first words to the very last. And of course, Rowling does literally get the last word. The final episode concludes with this. There are more important things in this world than being popular. And that doesn't mean it's more important to me to be right. It means it's more important to me to do the right thing. Why would you end on that note? Why would anything about this podcast be the way it is if Megan didn't fundamentally believe that J.K. Rowling is in the right? I don't regret it because I did the right thing. Like there really is no other reasonable way to interpret this. So I wish that she would just be honest. If you believe that JK Rowling is the misunderstood victim of a witch hunt, 
then just say that. Make the argument you want to make. Don't crouch and hide behind this disavowal, this obfuscating veil of just asking questions. Don't rely on But they do that because it helps them build. It helps them build that little shell, that reinforcing shell that lets you convince, no, I am actually rational. No, I am impartial. I am unbiased. I've talked about this sort of thing so much uh, in the ways that I talk about how Christianity, specifically extreme Christianity, gets people to the way that they are and the way that by and large the conservative movement in America uh, gets people to the level of disconnection with reality that we see where people just believe completely and utterly false things. And it's through stuff like this. Things like this have to exist in the ecosystem to convince the people who are actively being indoctrinated to go deeper because no, 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 I am unbiased. I, I am, I really am. I, I See, I take in both sides and the both sides is a person who is pretending to be centrist or liberal or fair. It's a very, very sinister uh, manipulation tactic, but it's incredibly important in building the shell of indoctrination, uh, of, of thought terminating cliches, uh, of, of, of uh, a lack of critical thinking. It is a part of the process that erodes the ability to see clearly and that lets you get pulled even further and further into these uh, deranged worldviews that, that have you hating everybody that you meet. Yep. Let's continue. An innuendo and framing and lachrymose Gregorian chanting to make your point while coyly denying you have any kind of agenda beyond, I just believe in conversation. I don't know. I just find this a slippery and dishonest way to argue. But if you happen to be a fan of slippery and dishonest arguments, you're in luck because there is more where that came from. This video is sponsored by Cannabox. Cannabox offers fresh human meat delivered directly to your doorstep. Cannabox. Cannabox offers fresh human meat. As a pathologic player, I'm looking at that and, and my eyes are just turning into money, okay? I know that this is a, it's a long, it's a deep cut. I haven't talked about pathologic in a while, okay? But you open that up and you're like, a heart, a liver, a slab of meat and some sausages? I'm rich, I'm living for, I'm living high on life. Play Pathologic 2 now. Go play Pathologic 2 now. Go. Go play it. It's the best game that's ever been made. It's my favorite game that's ever been made. You should go play it. Yeah, it also has overlaps with Hannibal for sure. But uh, people who've played Pathologic will know exactly why. People who haven't, well, you'll get there. Let's continue. Delivered directly to your doorstep. As an alphabet mafiosa, sometimes I just can't fit the most dangerous game into my busy lifestyle of destroying the family and recruiting children. Whenever a new box arrives, I get out my copy of Bless This Food, the Anita Bryant family cookbook. The best thing about human meat delivered to your home by mail in the dead of night? You don't know who you're eating. So it's totally guilt-free. No! No! No, that's not the fun part! Anyway. And ethically sourced. Maybe. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism. That means you're not allowed to cancel me. Chapter 4. Joe Rose Transphobia. That's it! I'm going full Slytherin. In episode 5 of The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, Joe Rowe compares trans activists to Death Eaters, the fictionalized fascists in Harry Potter. My oh, uh, sorry, before we go any further, can I remind everyone that they are going to be doing a HBO Max uh, TV series of the Harry Potter books now. And I just want you, just, just for one minute, I want us all to just taste and savor the, the forecoming 
cringe because the HBO Max TV series in the future where JK Rowling tries to say that the Death Eaters are trans people is, oh, it is going to be, oh God, it's gonna be so delicious. It's gonna be like a big hearty cringe sandwich. It's a gift, okay? I know that it's gonna be hateful bigotry, but it's also going to completely flop. And also we're going to get to laugh at one of the cringiest things that has ever been created. I cannot wait. I truly, I'm not kidding you, completely unironically, I can't wait. It's gonna be so good. Let's go. My position is that this activist movement in the form that it's currently taking echoes the very thing that I was warning against in Harry Potter. The Death Eaters claimed we have been made to live in secret and now is our time. I am fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement. When an article then claimed she had equated trans- I hope they make Hermione a fart fetishist. Why would they- why would they do that? I'm sorry, Chatter. Why would they do that? Like, I, I agree, the TV show is gonna be cringe, but why would they do that? <laughs> why would you say that? Uh, okay. Against people to Death Eaters, the podcast's PR firm reached out demanding a correction because she only equated the movement to Death Eaters not trans people in general. Yeah, I don't hate marginalized people, I just hate it when they advocate for themselves. So I do have to be very careful with my wording here, lest a defamation letter arrive by owl. JK Rowling's bigotry is exhausting to argue with, because she expresses it as an endless series of what are called Mott and Bailey arguments. Uh, a Mott favorite. and Bailey argument is named after a type of castle consisting of a Mott, that is, a tower atop a mound or hill, easy to defend, and a bailey, a fenced courtyard that's much more vulnerable to attack, difficult to defend. So a Mott and Bailey argument is when someone makes a provocative claim that's difficult to defend, the bailey. And then, when confronted with counter-arguments, they walk it back to a much less controversial and easy to defend version of the claim, the Mott. For example, Rowling will make an ambiguous claim like sex is real. What does she mean by that? What are the implications? Well, in the podcast, she explains that she thinks it's very sinister that in the Associated Press style guide, it says that instead of referring to a trans woman as a man who identifies as a woman, journalists should simply say a trans woman is a woman. That, from the Associated Press, is hugely powerful. They've edged from identifies as a woman, so a man identifies as a woman, which, I, and I think we all understand what that means, into is a woman, and that's precisely the creep that I'm talking about. We are using language to make accurate definition of sex difference. Oh my God, gender and sex is different? <gasps> Unspeakable. Which is of course false, because the words trans and- Unspeakable cis exist precisely to make it easy to talk about sex difference. Thanks a lot, Tumblr. God, there's this whole section of the podcast that sort of implies that transgender people were invented on Tumblr, which I'm not even gonna get into because we don't have time. Rowling has also tweeted that she thinks that all people who menstruate must be referred to as women. Or was it Wumpin? I'm pretty sure it was Wump Mud. So trans men and trans masculine people, they're all women and must be referred to as women because JK Rowling demands it. This is controversial, right? Calling trans women men who identify as women, calling trans men women. This is the Bailey in her Mott and Bailey argument. Trans women are men, trans men are women. That's the controversial interpretation of sex is real. Now, when accused of transphobia and facing backlash, Rowling walks the argument back and says, I'm being persecuted just for saying that women should be allowed to discuss how being female has shaped our lives. Women should yeah. be allowed. This is, this is what, what, what ContraPoints is outlining here is 
basically the <laughs> is the entire every conversation that you will ever have with a turf ever this is how it goes 99 percent of the time and the reason why it's specifically turfs that you will have this conversation with is because turfs have to continue pretending that they are feminists and so uh if you start going well wait you don't actually believe in gender you believe that sex is essential then don't you think that the the Christian people have a point? Don't you think that the Christians who are saying that you were born the way God made you and you should get in the kitchen and then they go, well, no, 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 no. They don't like that look. They don't like it being pointed out that the arguments that they're making actually support a worse worldview. Now, you'll notice that this type of tactic isn't used by the far, the far, far right. The like, the Nazi types, the open Nazi types, they don't even bother with a Mott and Bailey. They just straight up will say what they mean. And by the way, this is why some people say it's more refreshing sometimes to argue with a Nazi because at least they'll just say what they actually believe instead of like cloaking in a bunch of other stuff. Obviously that is also not true and Nazis do all kinds of other manipulative things in different circumstances, whatever the tactic uh, needs at the moment. But this type of tactic is most common with turfs who need to who need to continue the illusion that they're actually feminists when they're not let's continue to discuss how being female has shaped our lives this is the obvious and utterly uncontroversial interpretation of sex is real the mot and virtually every argument sophisticated transphobes make about trans people follows this pattern. JK Rowling's friend and ally Maya Forstadter will tweet inflammatory things like, men cannot change into women. But then when she's criticized, she'll say that she's being attacked for gender critical belief. Gender critical belief, which is the absolutely ordinary belief about sex that you're mother and your eddie says does anybody remember when matt walsh ended up fighting with a bunch of turfs for exactly this reason yes you will notice that matt walsh being a open theocratic fascist will regularly say things like no women don't really deserve rights other than the right to be submissive to their husband like matt walsh believes that women are divined are like divine by divine right of god are supposed to be submissive to men all over the place and so of course when it comes push comes to shove he'll be like you feminists are jokes yeah even you ones who agree with me on trans stuff it's such a fucking dirty anyway yes let's continue grandmother are women being female is a thing your mother and grandmother are women being female is a thing that's literally all i'm saying but if that's literally all she was saying then no one would be mad would they? Nine. Nar. Men cannot change into women is the Bailey. Your mom is a woman is the Mott. Your mom's a woman. <laughs> this is why arguing with these people is infuriating. They'll insinuate that trans women are dangerous rapists, exhibitionists, and voyeurs. Then when trans people understandably get mad, they'll say, look, I'm being attacked just for saying that being female is part of my experience. It's dishonest. They talk a bunch of trash about trans people, and then when trans people talk trash back, they pretend that they're being victimized for making totally innocuous statements. We could name this behavior the birthday boy argument. I dated a five- Hey! Remember just- Yo! Me and ContraPoints were on the same vibe. Remember just like two streams ago when I was correctly criticizing Anna Kasparian and Cenk, I kept saying they were doing the birthday boy by saying, we were getting uh, we were getting punched in the face by these people online. They were punching me in the face. And I'm like, with their opinions? They were punching you in the face with their opinions? The 12 people you don't get? And then I said he was birthday boying? Based. Same wavelength. Incredible. A guy who'd taunt every jacked 6'3 bro he met. And your, your, your jank sounds halfway to an Alex Jones. I know I don't have a good jank impersonation. I don't think I ever will because I don't care to. But yeah. Until they'd pull their fist back to beat him up, whereupon my ex would go, hey, 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 come on. I'm a little guy. I'm just a little guy. No, it's also my birthday. I'm a little birthday boy. And somehow it always worked. So a birthday boy argument is when you make aggressive inflammatory assertions followed by 
teacher, teacher, look what he's doing to me, when the target reacts with anything less than extreme politeness. Another common tactic you'll see anytime Rowling's transphobia is discussed is you'll see someone jump in. Natalie watches Demon Mama confirmed. I doubt that highly, but it would be cool. One can, one can, one can hope. I think it would be super cool. I think it would be awesome, honestly, if more people in this space would check out my stuff. It would be cool, all right? It would be cool. I just think it would be great. And just say, show me one thing she's said. By the way, if you're watching and you're having a good time right now, you should like, subscribe, and toss a comment down below. Comments, likes, and subscribes are how my channel grows so that other cool people can know that I'm doing cool stuff and can have a fun time. You're having a good time. You're laughing. We're memeing. We're learning. We're talking about things. We're, we're doing all of it. So press like, subscribe, and leave a comment. It means the world to me. Let's continue. Ed, that's transphobic. For example, here's someone on Twitter called Large Gamete Producer. It's funny, isn't it? Sorry, Demon Mama, I'm an anarchist. I don't take orders to like things. That's a hierarchy. <laughs> Joke's on you. All anarchists have domination kinks, and that will make you want to press the like button even more. Suck it. How these people will insist that awkward inclusive language like people who menstruate is horribly oppressive and degrading, but then they'll just straight up call themselves large gamete producer. Which, by the way, is Rowling's definition of a woman. The woman is um, the producer of the large gametes. Oh, I like it. It's I am, I feel so fucking vindicated right now. This whole fucking, the whole recent Anna Kasparian drama where Anna Kasparian was making a big hubbub about supposedly being called a birthing person only to make the argument that TERFs make, which is that a woman is somebody who menstruates, that those things are the same thing. It's, oh God, it's brain melting. They do it, they just did, JK Rowling just did it. Ah, it makes me crazy. Oh God, it makes me crazy. God, it makes me crazy. Let's go. It's very brood mother. That Rowling's words regularly appear in gender critical arguments shows the massive influence that she has in the anti-trans movement. She's like their queen, their, their, their leader, their, their headmistress. She's the best thing that ever happened to them. Cause Sheila Jeffries certainly wasn't persuading a lot of people. If you know, you know. Large gamete producers says, JK isn't anti-trans. Give me just one direct quote that she has said, which is anti-trans. Oh, what's that? You can't find one? Well, color me shocked. Imagine. Before we waste our time trying to provide <laughs> examples, let's take a look at large gamete producer's profile. Trans women are not women, they are men. Trans men are not men, they are women. Nothing can change that. Sex is binary. Like if this person doesn't think that trans women are men, trans men are women is a transphobic statement, then what would they consider a transphobic statement? This is why the first Ah, a good question, because the following argument would be, well, there's no such thing as transphobia because trans people don't really exist, which is what we saw M Michael Knowles doing recently. That's the next step. Ah, ah, yes. Question you should always ask such people is, do you believe that transphobia is a legitimate concept? What are some examples of statements that you would consider transphobic? Because many of them don't believe that transphobia is a- What? What did I say his name wrong? I don't care! I do not fucking care how you're supposed to say that fucking golem's name, okay? I don't- I don't care. He's a homunculus. I don't care if his name is Knowles, Nowles, I don't fucking care. So shut the fuck up. You're never gonna get me to give a shit. I don't care. I'll call him Mikey. A valid concept because they don't think that trans people are a legitimate minority. There's no such thing as a trans woman. There's no such thing as a trans person. There is no such thing. There are people that call themselves these things that may have other issues manifesting that then make them think they're this, but no, we have to stop using any words like transgender. There may be more words that we have to say in order to say that we may call it transgender ideology, uh, but when it comes to a person, they may be following transgender ideology, but they are not transgender. There is no such thing as a man or a woman being anything. It should be illegal. It should be illegal to use animation spells 
on wax figurines. It really should. Somebody needs to somebody needs to talk to the witch's coven and tell them to stop bringing the Madame Tussauds uh, statues to life because I am getting really tired of this shit. I'm getting really tired of these weird, melted looking, uh, you know, freaks. Negative drip. Well, she has drip, but the drip is the wax leaking from her face to the ground in real time. Other than a man or a woman. So when they say, show me an example of something transphobic J.K. Rowling has said, this is a trap. They're just messing with you. There's nothing that she could have said that they would acknowledge as transphobic. Now, if you're someone who believes that transphobia is a valid concept and you believe that trans people are a legitimate minority, but you just genuinely are unaware of what JK Rowling has said on the topic, then I will- Rhodes in YouTube chat says, I would have greatly appreciate if you didn't use the word golem to describe an anti-Semitic asshole like Knowles. I get what you mean, but it's real. It's it's really annoying when our stuff gets used to mean evil thing. Oh, to be fair, I don't mean it as like evil thing. Uh, I feel like the golem has expanded beyond just the initial legend. Uh, I generally use it to mean like an animated non-human thing, just so that we're clear. Just just for future things, uh, as you guys all know, I am a big fan of the golem legend, but I just think that like. I mean, it's all over in fantasy, and it doesn't necessarily mean the evil thing. It's like, you know, something that gets brought to life. Like a homunculus. Yeah, just so you're clear. I'll refer you to my past video on J.K. Rowling's transphobia, rather than recapping it all here. Just keep in mind that she's gotten significantly worse since I made that video. I mean, just look at her Twitter feed. True, she never says the phrase, I hate trans people, because she's not a complete idiot. But Anita Bryant never said, I hate gay people. She said, save our children. I love homosexuals. For that matter, I'm pretty sure David Duke doesn't say I hate black people, but he will share a lot of statistics about anti-white crime. So this is not really a very good criterion for deciding who's a bigot, is it? What JK Rowling does do is tweet again and again about transgender rapists, about the danger trans women pose to cis women. She implies that trans-inclusive language is equivalent to the dystopia of Orwell's 1984. She writes at length about the vague, nefarious cabal of endocrinologists and ideologues that is supposedly persuading confused, vulnerable girls to transition. To quote Washington Post opinion writer Monica Hess, I do not know what is in Rowling's heart, but reading her Twitter feed, this is the overall effect. Her Twitter feed does not ask its readers to think. It asks them to fear. It creates phobias of trans people. It creates trans phobias. <laughs> if you will. Rowling has also attacked pro-trans politician Nicola Sturgeon, calling her destroyer of women's rights via a t-shirt she got from anti-trans hate monger Posey Parker. There's no such thing as a trans woman. There's no such thing as a trans person. There is no such thing. If there's one thing that I want people to understand about Rowling's transphobia, it's that this is not a case of someone posting a couple insensitive tweets that got blown out of proportion. Rowling is an yep. extremely Correct. outspoken opponent of trans rights. This has been her main issue for several years now. And because she's so famous, she's become the de facto global champion of backlash to trans rights. Truly the Anita Bryant of transphobia, except worse because she's way more famous and way more liked than Anita Bryant ever was. Rowling has also praised self-described for now, for now. You know, it's very funny. But historically, go anti-woke, go broke is actually way more accurate than go woke, go broke. You guys remember, uh, remember, do you guys remember Graham Linehan? Remember that guy? Anybody remember that guy? Graham Linehan used to have shows and then he devoted his literal entire life to hating on trans people in the most deranged ways you could possibly imagine. Like, it's not just a matter of he was canceled. He stopped making other things. He stopped hanging out with his family. He stopped writing new shows just to hate trans people. So, you know, yeah, just, just saying. 
described theocratic fascist Matt Walsh for his transphobic propaganda film, she refers to trans women as trans-identified males, known as Tims among people for whom this has become an unhealthy obsession. She retweets images of the trans colors being erased from the progress flag, also the colors representing queer people of color, so you know, great. Love that. Often, Rowling pretends that she's being transphobic for the principled and valiant purpose of defending lesbians. It's something of a fixation for her. I find this particularly gross because it plays into the lesbophobic trope that gay women are especially anti-trans, when in fact they're the least transphobic demographic of cis people. According to- TRUE! TRUE! That's so true! Listen, uh, I have met so many lesbians in my life, and and by and large, lesbians are super, super cool and chill with trans people. People like uh, the TERFs and whatever give lesbians a bad name, and they also just lie because they need, th they need to feel like they're special and that people don't find them insufferable. But they do. According to a survey of young adults in the UK, lesbians were most likely to know a trans person and also most likely at 96% to say that they're supportive or very supportive of trans people. So I think it's fair to say that most gay women are probably not super thrilled whenever Joe Rowe the lesbian defender logs on. My own partner is a cis lesbian and I asked her if she enjoys JK Rowling defending her from the transsexuals and she said, it makes me want to gouge out my eyes like Oedipus. By the way, here is JK Rowling enjoying a bit of banter with her friend Baroness Emma Nicholson, the co-founder of Rowling's charity Lumos. Baroness mm. Nicholson is a conservative member of the House of Lords who voted against same-sex marriage in 2013. In 2020, she tweeted in defense of her vote, claiming that gay marriage would lead to degrading the status of women and girls. Truly, one of the great lesbian allies. And in 2022, here is J.K. Rowling joking around with Lady Nicholson. Excellent question, Emma. Defining lesbians as same-sex attracted women excludes and oppresses the most marginalized of all groups, i.e. people with penises and beards who want to shag women. And before you say, but aren't they straight men? They're wearing eyeliner, bigot. Try for a moment to put aside any nostalgia you may have for the Gryffindor common room and just look at this interaction for what it is. Two straight women, one of whom is a homophobic peer of the realm, having a nice little chuckle together about how trans women are men wearing eyeliner. So that's it, right? It's over. Case closed. I still like hammering things. That was a, that was a sick move. That was a sick move. I'm, I, I was sick. I'm not gonna argue anymore. See, that's the type of stuff that video essayists can do that, that us streamers can't do. If I tried to do that, look, if I tried to do a cool trick right now, that's what happens. And you have to see it because I don't get to just put in the good take, okay? You have to watch me drop things, okay? And that was an easy one. Ah, I almost, unironically almost just fell out of my chair, which would have been really funny. But see, I couldn't, I can't even get the co comedic timing right because I didn't actually, I only almost fell out of my chair. I should have fallen, I should have intentionally fallen out of my chair. And you all would have been like, ha 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 ha. And then everybody would have liked and subscribed and given me money about whether JK Rowling is transphobic, because anyone who believes in transphobia can see that obviously she is. The question now is whether transphobia is the sort of thing that progressives can denounce, the way we at least aspire to denounce racism, misogyny, and homophobia. That's usually what we're talking about when we talk about JK Rowling, right? Whether it's fair to cancel her. That's what the witch trials of JK Rowling is about. The Rowling debate is a proxy for a larger question. Is transphobia a legitimate viewpoint worthy of polite consideration and respect in liberal humane society? Or is it just an ugly prejudice that we can justifiably react to with scorn and condemnation? And there's an even broader question here about whether we can justifiably react to anything with scorn and condemnation. Is canceling ever warranted? Is it right to condemn racism, homophobia, and misogyny? 
Or should we allow spokespeople for these prejudices a respected position in the free marketplace of ideas, where we can all sit around debating the legitimacy of gay marriage or the possible merits of a white ethnostate? Is the final solution a myth? promulgated by the international Jew? Are yoga pants to blame for sexual violence? Wouldn't the taxpayers save a lot of money if there weren't so many disabled people? Who knows? These are open questions. Let's sit down with people on both sides, on many sides, and have calm, civil conversations about it for the rest of our goddamn lives. Chapter 5. Debate. Sar, I know I did this look before and it's like not related to the video topic at all, but it just makes me feel sliving. The boy who slived. So Megan Phelps Roper's viewpoint seems to be- What's sliving? What's sliving? Also, this does- this is a good look. This is a good look. Is this the debate bro section? I don't know. We'll see if I agree. For those who might be new to my channel, and watching this react to the first time, I have done a lot of debates. I like debates, generally. I like to debate people. I've always been a bit argumentative. I find debate to be, it gets the blood pumping. But I also have a lot of critiques for debates. Uh, I think that there is a tendency to devalue uh, 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 debates in some ways and overvalue them in other ways. For example, I think a lot of people um, tend to believe that you can you can de-radicalize uh, religious extremists through the power of debate, which I think is insane and incorrect and actually like leads to people making really bad decisions because it's really, really, really difficult to do that actually. Um, however, there are other people who basically say there's no point to debating anything. But that's not true either, because actually debates can be really, really good at inoculating people against bad arguments. So while a debate might not be able to actually save someone from the depths of indoctrination, in fact, people deeply indoctrinated are very unlikely to be affected by a debate, um, debates can uh, serve as a part of a greater uh, ecosystem that makes people more resistant to extremely manipulative uh, uh, tactics. So I'm one of those people who, uh, I actually think debates are really super important. However, they're important in ways that most people don't say. Most people get it all wrong, basically. I, basically, I'm, I'm smarter than you. So there you have it. Let's continue. That scorn and condemnation are never- Oh wait, I actually, I rambled and then I didn't say what I meant to say. Uh, I, I used to be a member of the debate community a long time ago. Uh, my channel's been going for a long time. When I was tiny, teeny, tiny, I used to do debates as my primary content. Uh, I would do video games and I would do debates and I would talk about the news. Um, and uh, debates were really important uh, to me at that point. And I like formally left the debate spheres because they're deranged. Uh, partially for reasons that I mentioned, but I, so just keep that in mind it while, while I'm reacting to this, that's the perspective I'm coming from. I'm coming from the perspective of somebody who really likes debates, who thinks debates are important in a certain way, but who also explicitly left debate communities because of how deranged and unhealthy they are. So yeah. Yep. Anyway, let's continue. A lot of people who are in chat right now are speaking up that they discovered me because of debate streams, which is awesome. Um, although uh, that number is shrinking because of the type of co the type of content that I do now is much broader than just that. Yeah. Anyway, let's continue appropriate. That we should approach every conflict with empathy and compassion, even when dealing with the worst, most destructive people in the world. Hi, my name is Megan, and my heretical belief is that even the people who seem to be the worst, most destructive people in the world are human beings who deserve compassion and empathy if we want to find a way to change their minds. In her book, in her TED talk, in her public appearances, Megan expresses the idea that society has recently become polarized in some unprecedented way, that we've all become extremists, that in some sense, we've all become the Westboro Baptist Church. I can't help but see in our public discourse so many of the same destructive impulses that ruled my former church. 
She identifies things like certainty, vilification of compromise, us versus them. Th okay. That is so... This is something that can happen sometimes. Um, that people have like a, a really negative experience and understandably they, they, they see the world in relation to that experience. But some people take it too far. No, actually, the average person is basically nothing like the people who are in the Westboro Baptist Church. People who are in the Westboro Baptist Church are indoctrinated and have their critical faculties uh, broken down to a degree that most people can't even actually understand. Um, and, and while it is true that there are certain aspects of our society that behave similarly, like for example, I should be um, I should I should be clear on this. Um, like for example, the uh, normalization of the mistreatment of disabled people is incredibly in. It's like it's like it, it's indoctrinated into our society, and that is a shared point between people who are deep within the Westboro Baptist Church and. Uh, everyday people, that everyday people have horrible beliefs that they don't even think about because they've been sort of, they've been around them for so much of their life that they never even think about it. However, I need to point out the fact that the Westboro Baptist Church people have all of those and way more, okay? They not only uh, have have ingested all of these sort of uh, pieces of, of propaganda that that perforate or that uh, permeate, that's not the word perforate is the wrong word, permeate our society, but that they also believe that Satan buried dinosaur bones to, uh, to trick modern scientists. Uh, they also believe that God personally wants to strike down every person who's ever even thought about being nice to a gay person. So it is, it's funny that there are certain people who basically escape that system only to believe that actually it's more normal than you think. And, and I just know, actually, these extreme cults are not huge because they require an unbelievable amount of dissolution of, of, of critical thinking. And that's not me saying that everyday people don't engage in a certain amount of similar behaviors, but the, the degree is so much more. Yes. Yep. Anyway, let's continue. Thinking, suppression of empathy, and celebration of death and misfortune as Westboro-like elements in public discourse. And this really bothers Megan, because she claims that a decade ago, when she went on Twitter to tweet about how f marriage is abominable to God, it was people who engaged her in a civil, rational way that eventually led her to renouncing Westboro's ideology. And like... Vine says, wait, isn't this the point Vosh made that you disagreed with? What? I don't think so. No? No? I don't think so? You'd have to be way more clear than that. Sorry. I don't entirely disagree with Megan about this. She's totally right that if you want to change people's minds, then approaching them with compassion and empathy is usually the best way to do that. But Megan reaches another conclusion that I don't agree with, which is that because compassion and civil conversation are most likely to persuade people, we should never cancel anyone, even the most horrible bigots. And canceling is a pretty meaningless term at this point, but what Megan means is we shouldn't say mean things to bigots. We shouldn't boycott or counter protest or raise our voices. We shouldn't shun or exclude anyone because that's just not how you change minds. And I get why Megan thinks this, right? De-radicalization was a really important part of her life experience. She's also clearly holding out hope that other members of her family will leave Westboro and have a life on the outside. She has a quote from her mom in her Twitter bio. The last lines of her book address her family. I want to tell them that I love them. I'll just have to find another way. This is touching and human and also kind of a conflict of interest. The problem is Megan's views about this only make sense if you assume that Megan is the main character of reality. If you assume that the moral improvement of bigots is more important than protecting the people they target. Or if you assume that changing bigots' minds is the only way to make social progress, which it isn't. As far as I know, Anita Bryant- Correct, and by the way, I, 100, I, I absolutely agree with this. 
um, you have to remember that extreme bigots are a minority. Part of their tactic relies on f on basically letting them become the uh, uh, the main characters all the time. Um, yeah, so. You have to be very careful. I'm not saying that you should abandon that that people as a whole should abandon all bigots, but that de-radicalization and this is the argument I've made for a very long time. De-radicalization is a very difficult process uh that that re often requires a very personal connection to the people that you're talking about. Like people who get people who get out of cults like myself it's rarely ever YouTube videos that do it. Sometimes YouTube videos help, and sometimes YouTube videos uh, serve as like uh, like healing, as a process of healing after the fact, but it's almost always personal connections. Uh, teachers, friends, family members, uh, life experiences that lead people to challenge these, these deep indoctrinations that they have. Um, I've told my story many times. Again, I'm sure people will put the link in the chat. I have a whole video called My Spiritual Deconstruction where I talk about this. Um, but yeah, I, I have to say I, I agree with the fact that um, debating uh, uh, radical, hyper-radicalized people is not only not the only tactic, but also it's an expensive tactic that you have to be careful about. Yeah, let's continue. Aunt is 83 years old, and she's still homophobic. But even without Anita's blessing, gay rights have still somehow managed to progress since the 1970s. Because gay activists didn't need to persuade Anita Bryant. They needed to defeat her. And that's what they did. We have to accept that realistically, persuading all the bigots is just not an option. Yes, we should convince as many people as possible, but there will always be bigots, and mocking them, shaming them, or boycotting them is, I think, a perfectly valid strategy. Does I that agree. mean that when we cancel bigots, we're acting kind of like the Westboro Baptist Church? Nar. You would only think that if you're a total moral relativist. I guess controversial opinion, but bigotry is shameful, and it should be shamed. I'll say it. You know, if you're testing out some racist ideas in your head, you might feel afraid to express them publicly for fear of being shamed or judged. Is that because we live in an Orwellian dystopia that punishes people for wrong think? No, it's because racism is dangerous and shameful and you should be ashamed of it and the people judging you are right to do so. And sure, there are some very patient people who devote their lives to de-radicalizing bigots, which I think is a perfectly noble thing to do. There's a guy named Daryl Davis who's befriended members of the Ku Klux Klan for over 30 years, and he claims he's convinced more than 200 of them to leave. And good for him. De-radicalization is a valid strategy, but it cannot be the only strategy, and it must not be the primary strategy. I hate to say this, but there's a lot of criticism around Daryl Davis. I, I, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, but uh, his narrative is, uh, he's been criticized a lot. Let's just put it that way. Let's continue. Because we're not going to defeat racism by telling black people to be a little nicer to racists. Feminists would be wasting their time trying to convince Andrew Tate to respect women. In general, I think that the massive effort that it takes to maybe persuade bigots is better spent persuading other people not to listen to them. And it's also worth cautioning that de-radicalization is often a messy and incomplete process. 20-year-old white nationalist Peter Saitanovic became the face of the fascist Unite the Right rally in 2017 when a photo of him mid-scream, tiki torch in hand, was published in news outlets all over the country. Peter was unrepentant in interviews he gave immediately after the rally, but he began to question his beliefs after befriending a Muslim woman who, according to Charlotte McDonald Gibson, challenged his views without insulting him, allowing him to understand the hurt he had caused. Peter is no longer a white nationalist, but that doesn't mean he's flushed out every trace of bigotry. In a 2019 interview with the London School of Economics student paper, Peter said, I don't like the whole transgender thing. You're born either a man or a woman. <sighs> 
So he maybe still has a little bit of work to do. When I did de-radicalization work on YouTube, I used to get some criticism from people of color who were not thrilled that I was bringing a bunch of semi-reformed racists over to the left, a frustration that I totally understand. To paraphrase YouTuber Ian Danskin, diverse leftist communities are maybe not the best holding space for someone who's a bit of a Nazi but working on it. In the case of Megan Phelps Roper, I don't know if she has lingering bigoted sentiments, but what she does have is a kind of hypervigilant skepticism about anything she perceives as ideology. This is pretty common with people who used to be religious fundamentalists. They were so certain they were right, only to realize that everything they believed about the world is wrong. So they become distrustful of any strong moral convictions because it reminds them of their former fanaticism. Coming from Westboro, where I believed so strongly that I was doing the right thing, and then to leave and come to believe that it, it was so destructive and harmful, I had this, this moment in time, and it lasted for, for many months, where I was like, how can I ever trust my own mind again? This kind of skepticism is in some ways a good impulse, but valuing dispassionate intellectualism above all else can cause- By the way, part of that is intentional. That is the, that is the spikes that are left in your brain uh, from, uh, from religious indoctrination. It is, it, is, uh, it is designed to reinforce returns. A lot of people temporarily leave cults and end up going back to them because they leave and they feel like they don't know where they are, they feel disoriented, they feel uh, like they don't have an identity anymore, and then they return because they, they then see that as proof uh, that, that they were lost without the cult. Um, it's an unfortunately common thing. It's part of the, those are, it's part of the design. The des uh, like, for example, as, as a very specific example, um, a lot of extreme Christian churches will teach you that um, there is a hole in every person's soul that can only be filled by God. And that if you leave the church, no matter how far you run, no matter how far you go, you will never escape a, the hole in your soul that can only be filled by God. And of course, this is a very manipulative tactic because every human feels that sensation. On the entire planet Earth, at some point in your life, you are going to feel dissatisfied, pain, loneliness. It is a, a intrinsic part of the human experience as far as I can tell. It's not the lack of God, it is just a product of being human. That at times in your life, you will, you will have desires that are unfulfilled. You will sometimes have hardships with, which leave you feeling empty inside. Like, I mean, when you feel grief or when somebody you love uh, leaves your life for one reason or another. Um, but churches will drive this home like crazy. They'll say that, oh, all these people out there, anybody who's unhappy out there, they're unhappy because that hole can only be filled by God, in parentheses, us, the church. And so, of course, people who start to get distance will end up coming back and not leaving the church, or they'll, they'll, they'll go through great lengths because uh, they've been told specifically, no, 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 that's not normal. That's not a thing that all humans feel. And of course, the real truth is that tons of people feel it within the church. But often in the church, there are all of these other structures that are there to try and avoid you ever actually thinking about it. Or it's the blame is put on you. You're lacking faith. That's why you still feel the emptiness because you aren't connected enough to God. Do you see how this functions? Anyway, I just thought I would add something to that. Puerto Rican musician says, it's kind of like being off drugs. You initially feel better being sober, but then you realize you're still human and have problems just like everyone else. Yeah. Yep. A lot of Christians, a lot of former Christians in chat or, or people who've moved away from abusive churches mentioning that, they, that their church employed the God-sized whole thing. Yeah, it's super, super common. Unbelievably common. 
cause problems, especially where topics of social justice are concerned. Because it can lead you to this kind of toxic centrism that asks, why are marginalized people so unwilling to have calm, philosophical debates about whether they should have rights? Are they afraid of dangerous ideas? Atheist philosopher Sam Harris, in his podcast about Megan's podcast, can we talk about how there are too many podcasts? I'm calling for a complete and total shutdown of podcasts until we can figure out what's- No, in fact, I'm making a new podcast. <laughs> going on. Sam Harris, in his podcast about Megan's podcast, complained that trans activism and activism in general is plagued by mental illness and hysteria. I frankly think there, there's a fair degree of, of mental instability and, and even frank mental illness in the activist community. I mean, in, in, in really in all activist communities, the level of viciousness and hysteria is, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know what to compare it to. Diversity when man accuses trans women of being hysterical. Is it really hysteria to react with strong emotions when your basic inclusion in society is up for debate? Aren't there certain situations where strong emotions are warranted? It reminds me of this awful episode of Joe Rogan feat Ben Shapiro, where Lil Benny argues that gay marriage is immoral with his usual whining sophistry, and Joe gently raises objections idea. for Ben to talk circles around. The human sex drive was made to procreate within a stable relationship in order to progenerate and have future generations of people. Misuse of that sex drive in any way, whether you're talking about from masturbation to homosexual activity, is therefore a diminishment of the use of that drive. That's that's it, everybody. The conservative movement wants you to know where they're going to... See, he's broadcasting where they're going to go. First it's gay, then they're going to be throwing you in prison for the sin of fucking masturbation. And if you don't think I'm kidding, oh man, you don't want to know the type of shit that Christians have imposed on people. Did you know that there are states in the United States of America where right now it is illegal to buy and sell sex toys... Yeah, that's right. Still. Now, there are, of course, ways that people get around it. The personal massager is the, the most common way that people get around these rules. But keep in mind, those laws were a lot more common back in ye olde times, and they were enforced. You wonder why? Well, it's because of shit like this right here. Again, one more gigantic point in the these people are insufferable and nobody can stand them uh, uh, position. It's the natural law case against against homosexual activity. All of the top comments on this video are like this. Imagine talking about different beliefs while still having a productive conversation. Things progress when you don't demonize people. The discussion here was excellent. Two guys with opposing opinions, speaking calmly and intellectually without cursing, shouting and making disparaging comments about each other. This is how it should be done. Kudos to both of them. Joe is a great interviewer. He can totally disagree with someone and still have a calm, collective conversation. This is how it should be. Just two people sharing ideas, learning different point of views from each other. This is why Joe is the number one podcast. Joe Rogan beautifully asks the tough questions, and Ben answers honestly. He is strong in his faith. I love this debate because it's two so contrasting views and they have a civil conversation. Great oh, learning. Yeah. And like, yeah, it's easy for two straight men to have a dispassionate, theoretical conversation about the ethics of homosexuality because it's not their lives and their relationships that are up for debate. These people don't understand the emotional burden placed on marginalized people who are asked to defend their rights. Like, if you're straight, do you want to publicly debate whether your marriage is valid? Andrew Dworkin claimed that penetrative heterosexual intercourse is inherently an act of violence. I've noticed that most straight men don't want to have a calm, civil conversation about that. So imagine how they'd react if there was a powerful political movement to criminalize penetration or revoke their right to marry. Add in a lifetime of ostracism, family rejection, bullying, and discrimination, and maybe then you'll begin to understand That's okay, the hysteria Ellen. of a lot of queer people. It is my right to raise my child with the moral precept that I find to be beneficial for my child. 
Beto O'Rourke does not get to raise my child. And if he tries, I will meet him at the door with a gun. That is insane. Wow. Ben Shapiro, you're so brave. I'll have fi fight me IRL. I love how conservatives spend all day, every single day, literally acting, acting like Xbox Live fucking chatters. God, it's so embarrassing. They're so embarrassing. Threatening violence because he can't handle the debate. Sounds like a classic case of hysteria to me. Why can't Ben Shapiro just have a polite conversation about Beto O'Rourke transing his children? I now have two choices. One is to leave the country utterly. Two is to pick up a gun. Those are the only choices that you have left me. Dave Rubin is a gay conservative oh, yeah. whose career requires that he convince his right-wing audience that he's one of the good ones. This means that he's willing to sit across from his so-called friend, homophobe Ben Shapiro, and listen to Ben say he would never attend his anniversary party because it would be tantamount to endorsing sin. There's a difference between me just being friends with Dave and me actively participating in an event that I feel is religiously sinful. The two of them then congratulate themselves about how they can still be great friends. Why is it that we're able to do this and most people can't do this? Because That's what I'm curious about. we go about. home at night and we can have our own lives. And here's Dave having a civil conversation with conservative Glenn Beck, who compares homosexuality to alcoholism and then congratulates himself on having the conversation. I am a deeply religious man, and my religion says man and a woman, uh, that is the basic building block of family. And that's what I believe, but I also am, I also, I also know God created you just like he created me, flaws and all. Uh, you know, um, I believe I the dead look in Dave Rubin's I love I love how dead inside Dave Rubin looks at every moment the, the, the dead look in Dave Rubin's eyes is is like one of the biggest things that I know makes it so that people who have the ability to think won't fall for him they're just like man I never want to end up like that guy I have a gene they've never found it that makes me very susceptible to alcoholism because it runs in my family so does craziness, but it runs in my family. Well, Dave smiles and nods, probably because he's thinking about how much he enjoys the taste of boots. Usually, I just take out a picture of me and DeSantis, and then we're good, because they get it, they get it, that's my governor, yeah. I think a lot of straight people look at Dave Rubin, and they see, finally, a reasonable gay person who doesn't scream, bigot at everyone who disagrees and can actually have a civil conversation. But that's not what I see. I look at Dave Rubin and I see a sabineless, boot-licking doormat who won't even defend his own family from the most fundamental disrespect. I also can't help but notice yep. that none of these civil conversations seem to change anyone's mind. Persuasion is more complicated and less rational than people think. Megan often says that she was de-radicalized on Twitter, but if you read her book carefully, you'll notice that that's not exactly true. The major precipitating event for Megan's crisis of faith was her mother's mistreatment at the hands of an increasingly misogynistic church leadership that made Megan feel like- Remember what I said just a little bit before? You remember, you all remember what I've said in basically every single conversation I've ever had on this channel about de-radicalization, how de-radicalization is almost always caused by uh, a personal relationship or a personal experience that it's almost never you, you that de-radicalization is barely ever reached by youtubers okay in the same way that uh that seeing like a a, a disney movie is is basically never the reason that people become de-radicalized it can help it can help along the process. It can make the process a little easier. It might add to the to the pile, but it's never the most influential thing. Almost never. Very, very rare. Anyway, let's continue. She was the victim of the church for once. She says of the church discipline, for the first time in my life, the accused were people I lived with and knew most intimately. And I knew that the judgments leveled by the elders were wrong. I could no longer blindly trust the judgment of these men. So she finally experienced firsthand 
what it's like to be the victim of her family. She stopped voting for the leopards eating people's faces party only when the leopards ate her face. It also seems relevant to notice that the people who had calm, civil conversations with Megan on Twitter were generally not gay people, the people most affected by her family's violent rhetoric. They're mostly straight men, like director Kevin Smith, who started hashtag save Megan because, quote, she's hot. There's often an erotic component mm. to persuasion, and that certainly seems to be the case with Megan, because one of the people who helped de that's very weird. Nicolize her is now her husband. And I feel like that's a relevant detail. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean. I, I, hey. It is possible that there's an erotic connection there, but also. Still goes to what I was saying about a very personal connection. One of the main de-radicalizers in her life was a person that she ended up marrying. If we're trying to understand the role of reason and emotion in de-radicalization experiences. I think this experience is usually more akin to religious conversion than it is to logical reasoning. There's also a world of difference between the mostly private conversations that actually lead people to reflect on their beliefs and the spectacle of public debate. Ben Shapiro is never going to become less homophobic because he live streamed a civil conversation with Dave Rubin. So who is this conversation even for? Well, obviously it's for the audience. I think these civil conversations basically function to reassure a homophobic audience that just because they disagree with the lifestyle doesn't mean that they hate gay people. Look at Ben Shapiro. He's friends with a gay. Public debate is one way that we define the limits of the Overton window, the range of beliefs that are socially acceptable to hold. So often people who want to promote bigotry will use debate as a foot in the door. It's a way of establishing that their prejudices are within the realm of reasonable and socially accepted opinion. Here's obsessive anti-trans bigot Graham Linehan hey! in a few- it's our, it's it's the guy I just mentioned earlier, the per the, the the poster child for throwing your own life away to become a deranged bigot. Also, he's banned on Twitter now, which is great. Theory that a drag queen is on Doctor Who without the British public having a proper debate about these issues. Now, why do we need to have a proper debate? Oh, he's back! God damn it! About whether drag queens should be. Good night, Sarah the Sarah. I hope you have a wonderful night. Thanks for coming. ...be allowed on television, when drag performance has been a staple of British entertainment since at least the time of Shakespeare. Life is a joke that shall speak on. Fishy, 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 fish. As I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. As I am woman, Never last the day. Bigots like Graham want a perpetual debate on their own terms because this is how they dignify their pearl clutching. It's how they convince the public that their moral panic about drag queens on TV is actually a valid concern, rather than the tedious, small-minded whining about nothing that it really is. Having the debate on a bigot's terms is not a good way to win people over, unless you're really skilled in the art of humiliating people, which most of the time is what public debate is actually about. This is something that J.K. Rowling doesn't seem to understand. In The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, Joro takes a contradictory stance on deplatforming. She brings up right-wing provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos, saying that activists are making a strategic error and giving Milo power by protesting his events, making him look dangerous and sexy. But when trans people try to deplatform TERFs, Rowling characterizes this as silencing. So is deplatforming a strategic error that gives power to your opponent, or is it a powerful tactic of silencing? I find Rowling's conviction that we ought to debate Milo Yiannopoulos really out of touch. Milo Yiannopoulos doesn't have reasons 
for the things he does. He has strategies for humiliating people. I've taken some time out of my busy schedule, being fabulous and doing my hair, to prepare a speech for you. Well, a few remarks, really. Feminism is cancer. Thank you very much. To again quote Ian Danskin, you can't really re- I would die for another Milo Christian shop segment. Okay, my lovely viewers, many of you don't know this. This is totally just a fun little addition here. Milo Yiannopoulos has, uh, in recent memory, come a bit on hard times. He's not making the money or the fame that he used to. And he actually started, uh, he became a part of a a weird Catholic ex-gay cult that is led by a ex-homosexualist by the name of Michael Voris. Now, um, we have followed this story with, uh, in, with like eagle eyes because it's one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, for uh, anybody who's wondering, yes, Milo is absolutely 100%, 1000% uh, fucking the cult leader of the ex-homosexual uh, cult that he's a part of. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. In fact, they are literally flaunting it over their sheep-like following every single time they appear in public. Um, and also, Milo was assigned to do a, a Christian, um, like say, t TV sales, like a uh, 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 segment for the church. And there were multiple episodes that we on this channel have lovingly watched and had a blast watching. So if you want to see those for yourself, just search Demon Mama and Milo Yiannopoulos. And I assure you, you will find our coverage of w some of the funniest shit you've ever seen. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos having to be as straight as he possibly can and failing at it while trying to sell you crucifixes, um, fancy Bibles, Christian calendars, things like that. It's amazing. It's incredible, okay? Just wanted to let you know that that does indeed exist and it is available for your viewing pleasure right here on the Demon Mama channel. It's that easy. Let's continue reason with someone who thinks that feminism is cancer. Because you don't reason with cancer, you eradicate it. Rowling objects to the slogan, no debate, in the strongest possible terms. And then we come to the famous two-word slogan, the stock phrase, no debate, no debate, no debate. We hear it all the time. That alarms me, really alarms me. I can't think of a purer instance of authoritarianism than no debate. It's kind of amazing to me that- Really? You can't think of a s- oh, never mind. Let's Someone continue. can think angry trans people on Twitter are the purest example of authoritarianism. I truly hope that one day I am privileged enough to be capable of such a perspective. <laughs> Before I move on, I do want to clarify that I do think no, there nuts. are trans issues that are legitimately debatable by people who are not bigots. In my opinion, trans women and women's sports is one of those issues. But- it's a complicated issue. Like, first of all, which sport are we talking about? Are we talking about figure skating? Middle school field hockey? I see no reason why trans girls should be excluded from that. But if we're talking about professional weightlifting, well, then it seems plausible that trans women who have been through male puberty may still retain some kind of group advantage. But not all trans women have experienced male puberty. People are transitioning younger now, and that's another thing you have to consider. So I'm not against debating this issue, I just want people to approach it with nuance and good faith. And currently, a lot of the people who are vocally against trans women in women's sports sound like this. And we will keep men out of women's sports. Right? How ridiculous. God, he looks so terrible. That will take place. God, he looks, he literally, unironically looks like he's melting. It's on day one. And I don't want to debate those people. I want to serve them a banana cream pie. Every conservative that shows their face on here either looks like they're completely dead inside in the case of Dave Rubin, or looks like they are in the process of complete and utter decomposition. Uh, we've seen Posey Parker, who looks like she's melting, We've seen Donald Trump, who looks like he's melting and imploding. We saw Glenn Beck, who's bloating like a raccoon on the side of the road. 
And of course, we don't even need to talk about Milo. We know where we, everyone here knows what's going on with Milo. Milo's been having a fashion disaster ever since he got into that, uh, that mega kinky relationship with the cult leader. Chapter six, illiberal methods. He used to, I'm sorry. I know I'm going to keep going back on the Milo thing, but Jesus Christ. Okay. Milo. He, he, he used to really be all about the drip and he just can't anymore. Now he just ends up having to do like Joe Exotic cosplays. It's so sad. Anyway. One of JK Rowling's core complaints about the trans rights movement is she sees it as illiberal in its methods. So when I first became interested and then deeply troubled by what I saw as a cultural movement that was illiberal, in its methods. So what are these illiberal methods? If you are saying this person is cancelled, that is the language of a dictator. It's true. Cancel culture is exactly how the Third Reich started. First they cancelled the socialists, and I did not speak out because the hashtag was trending. But maybe we should see what an actual dictator thinks. Детского писателя Джоан Роулинг за то, что она автор книг, которые разошлись по миру сотнями миллионов экземпляров, не угодила поклонникам так называемых гендерных свобод. You know, I can't help but wonder what counts as acceptable activist methods to an author for whom Hermione protesting slavery was taking things too far. I am fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement. I do not see this particular movement as either benign or powerless. Rowling seems to think that the trans rights movement is de Nuts asks, how has the video been so far? Fantastic, actually. Um, it's a very straightforward uh, ContraPoints videos. Uh, most of ContraPoints videos are very, very theatrical, um, at least in recent memory. Honestly, this video is kind of a return a return to tradition for ContraPoints. This is a very old school uh, style ContraPoints video, but I liked, I like old and new school ContraPoints videos. Like, I like them a lot, okay? So, uh, honestly, I think the video has been fantastic so far. Um, it's been very deep, very detailed, highly cited. The editing has been fun, but not, uh, too over the top. The outfits are very good. Um, I like it. I think it's good. I think it's been great so far. So there we go. Gayfesh says it's gonna get bad real quick. Well, all right, we'll see. Let's continue. Dangerous and authoritarian in some unprecedented way that makes it different from all past liberation movements. But how? What are these illiberal methods that distinguish trans rights activism from similar? Tiaho asks, are you planning on covering the Destiny versus Milo debate at any point? No, that sounds horrible. Or past movements. Canceling? Anita Bryant was way more canceled than JK Rowling ever will be. Boycott? Oh, except for one thing, okay? I did hear that I heard through the grapevine that Milo showed up an hour late for the debate, and that is the most Milo thing that I've ever heard in my entire life. Milo just literally being like, oh, I'm fashionably late, and just, just literally making everybody wait for an hour. Oh, that is that is so Milo, it hurts. He was super drunk. Oh, that's also very Milo, okay? Milo is the messiest person you can possibly imagine. Let's continue. Boycotts have been a staple of every progressive movement in modern history. Disrupting feminist meetings? Disrupting feminist meetings is a feminist tradition. Haven't you heard of the Lavender Menace? In 1969, Betty Friedan, author of The Feminine Mystique and founder of the National Organization for Women and Second Wave Feminism in general, coined the phrase Lavender Menace to describe the threat she believed that lesbians posed to the women's movement. Friedan was worried that being associated with lesbians would make it easier easy to dismiss the movement as a bunch of mannish man-haters. This understandably pissed off a bunch of lesbians who attended the second Congress to Unite Women in 1970 to stage what 
used to be known as a ZAP, a disruptive public protest designed to draw attention to gay rights issues. Think glitter bombing. Think pies. Half aggression, half whimsy. Like that time the lesbian Avengers zapped Rowling's friend Baroness Nicholson's house, demanding that she resign. This podcast has pushed me over the edge. Centrism has gone too far and I am now pro-cancel culture. So just as the meeting was beginning, a group of 17 lesbians wearing Lavender Menace t-shirts switched off the lights, pulled the plug on the mic, and charged down the aisles laughing and screaming. Their leader, Rita Mae Brown, took the mic and yelled, This conference won't proceed until we talk about lesbians in the women's movement. One of the NOW organizers yelled back, I object to your coming in and taking over this meeting. You're acting like men. Betty Friedan would later speculate that the lesbians were a CIA psyop designed to make the women's movement Amazing. look bad. Amazing. So the Lavender Menace Incredible. disrupted the feminist meeting Super using rational. illiberal tactics, not because they were against feminism, but because they wanted lesbian exclusionary feminists to include them. It's the same thing that's happening today when trans people disrupt feminist meetings, as J.K. Rowling puts it, interestingly neglecting to mention which feminist meetings these are. I was starting to see activists behaving in a very aggressive way outside feminist meetings. There was a feminist meeting in which they were uh, banging and kicking on windows, very threatening. There's a historical obliviousness to Rowling's idea that tra oh, Banging on the windows! It's so threatening! Trans activists are somehow more aggressive than similar past movements. Like she retweeted a transphobic gay man called Dennis Noel Kavanaugh, who says, All those gay rights and AIDS protests, I don't remember a single one where we intimidated or silenced a woman. Not a single one. Not a single one. Not a single one. Not a single one. <laughs> Dennis has also tweeted that he preferred AIDS to the trans movement. And Not a single one. <laughs> Dennis has also tweeted. Well. Well, there you have it, I guess. Whew. At mermaids? At mermaids? Re at really at mermaids? Oh, these people are insane. That these he people are just, just, just in case, in case you needed any further evidence that the people who are aligned against trans people are fucking bonkers. Heard AIDS to the trans movement, and also, uh. Quote, I will fucking nail you to a wall what you have done to these innocent children. Your mutilation of these little human because they were gay will be nothing compared to what I will <laughs> to, to what I will do to you legally. You think you are ghouls? Wait till I deal with you, bastard, and I mean to. Dennis? Oof. It's time to log off, Gorge. I do wonder, does Dennis threatening to nail people to a wall? count as illiberal methods? I guess JK Rowling doesn't think so because she's never condemned it. In fact, when Dennis's Twitter suspension ended, she was right there to welcome him back. And she continues to retweet him. I've always been happy to acknowledge that angry trans people on Twitter sometimes take things too far. Things like death threats or misogynistic insults I don't support that, and I've called it out in the past. Like when the leftist streamer Vosh, <laughs> drama alert, who is not trans, tweeted at JK Rowling, women be quieter and start apologizing challenge. I called him out, tweeting, doing edgy ironic misogyny while defending trans people magnifies the grain of truth in what turfs say about there being misogyny in trans activism. I tweeted that because I recognize that if people who are claiming to speak for you are doing so in a misogynistic way, and if you let that slide, you're going to wake up one day to find that you're in a misogynistic movement. Of course, Vosh took the criticism really well, explaining that actually, I just didn't understand the complex tactical arguments for the moral necessity of being misogynistic to JK Rowling. And then he accused me of cancel culturing him while at the same time literally telling his followers to publicly shame me. The more viewer in the replies being like, that's not what's happening right here. Like this is necessary, okay? publicly shame her into 
changing our mind on this. Then bringing up my past struggle with addiction. Move you off this site and into... I don't want to bring up the substance abuse. So that pretty much confirms to me that Vosh doesn't actually care about advocating for trans people and just uses trans rights as a pretext to act like a fucking dinkus. I won't talk- Chat is, is clearly having a real one. Go on, get it out of your system. Go on, go ahead. Go on, everybody, get it out of the system. LB asks, Vosh just breathed, any comment? Well, of course, you fucking annoying assholes have been doing this the entire time. The, the entire stream, you cringe lords, have been filling my chat uh, with... Oh, this, that, and this joke. Even the people who are making uh, jokes about making jokes, sh the whole chat, every person who watches my video is going to be cringing at the fact that my community is just basically talking about another streamer the whole time. But me being elevated and smarter than literally every single one of you obviously has had restraint. But I have the right to talk about this now. So if you gotten it all, gotten it all out of your system. To be fair, I do this to myself by being a streamer at all. See, because um, when you're a streamer, basically your entire life is uh, that people treat you fucking weird all the time. That's that's basically what you sign up for. It's really, you know, it's really my fault that people are weird all the time. Um, but anyway, um. Uh, okay, so, um, I think that Co ContraPoints is wrong. I disagree with ContraPoints' characterization that as to whether Vosh does or does not care about trans people. Um, I'm going to start with that because I think that's the sort of conclusion and I want to address that outright. And I'm going to tell you why, okay? Um... You want a quote? Yeah, well, here you go. Here's your quote. You better fucking deliver this, you fucking pieces of shit. You all heckle me for it. So you better fucking deliver it when I do it, okay? Here you go. I think that ContraPoints is wrong with her conclusion about Vosh. And everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But I know Vosh personally. And also, I've been following Vosh and also been a notable critic of Vosh. In fact, I think I might be one of the most critical people of Vosh who is as close as I as any as like I am to Vosh not many people who are this close to Vosh are also as openly and publicly critical with Vosh I have had open beefs beefs I've had open disagreements with Vosh and the community of the internet has been pretty freaking stupid about it over and over again okay but nonetheless my opinions have always been mine I do think that ContraPoints is incorrect in this conclusion. And the reason why I think that ContraPoints is incorrect is because I genuinely do believe that Vosh cares about trans people uh, a lot. It's one of the topics that he has devoted the most of his personal life on the internet to arguing about in explicit favor of trans people, in explicit favor of non-binary people. Vosh isn't always perfect. and. I'm gonna be straight up and I'm gonna give my criticism here in a second. Um, sometimes he's a big asshole, a, a, a really big asshole. But I think that it's completely wrong to say that he doesn't care about trans rights because I genuinely think he does. In my personal interactions with him, in his interactions with my, my friends and my own partners, uh, in the way that he talks offline and of course, to be fair, because of course ContraPoints can only know him online, if you actually go and look at the whole arc of Vosh's work, I think it is undeniable that Vosh has devoted a ton of his platform to talking about explicitly arguing in favor of trans rights, even when it would cost him financially to do so. Hot, uh, you know, hot, hot, hot take here. It's not exactly a big money maker to spend your time on stream talking about trans rights. I have to talk about trans rights all the time because I'm a trans person, and guess what? My channel doesn't exactly make that much money, okay?
It's not a money-making topic. And yet, Vosh talks about it all the time and has talked about it all the time for years. For the years that I've been familiar with this content. Uh, so I just don't think it's accurate to say that. I think, uh, however, that that doesn't mean that uh, Vosh is completely without blame. Um, I think it was very careless of him to uh, uh, to not bring up the substance abuse. He said that to a live stream. It doesn't matter if he ended up tweeting that because he said that on his live stream where there was, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, oh, like over 10,000 people watching that stream. So it didn't really matter that he didn't tweet about the the uh, substance abuse because he talked about it on the live stream anyway. I think that was an unfair thing to do and I think it was sloppy and careless. I also think that it was sloppy and careless of him to uh, tell people to, to jump all over the tweet. You all know I literally started this video with it that in this community, one of the only hard and fast rules that I constantly repeat is we only raid with love. That's it. That's what this community does. We only ever raid with love. We never raid with hate. We never go and shame the shit out of people or anything like that. I don't think it's productive. People do that enough on the internet. I think it was careless. Um, but also, why is this here? Like, I don't understand why this is in this essay. So far, this video essay has been uh, very fixated on extremely relevant and factual events and I don't think it's relevant in any way that Vosh made a very silly joke uh, about J.K. Rowling. Especially when ContraPoints also makes edgy jokes. ContraPoints literally opened this video with a joke about kill your shitty child. Which, I'm just gonna hazard a guess here, and I don't think that ContraPoints literally wants to kill anyone's shitty child. Right? So I just think maybe that this is a little bit petty. And also you will recall I recently made a video criticizing the way that ContraPoints handled a disagreement with uh, 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 another trans content creator. Uh, and I think it was the same type of pettiness, the same willingness to sort of uh, pretend that you're not invoking your fan base to go be shitty to somebody while ultimately doing exactly that. Um, yeah. I just think it's a little bit petty and not all that interesting. Um, but, uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, but can I be real about something else too? Can I be 100% real about another aspect of this? which is, <laughs> I heard about this video not because of uh, the video itself, like coming across my subscription thing, but rather because a ton of people all over Twitter and in group chats and even in, 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 in discords that I am in started uh, uh, flipping out about the fact that there was a clip apparently with some drama between Contra and Vosh. And I gotta say, that's pretty fucking fragile. That's <laughs> turbo fragile. Like, it's honestly very embarrassing. It's one of the things that, uh, that makes me doom out a little bit. Like, not to be a, a huge buzzkill, but it makes me be like, man, you all are, are not able to be helped. And I don't, I don't mean to attack any one of you individually, but the collective, the collective chatosphere, sphere, the stream viewer sphere, the YouTube sphere, uh, what the fuck? <laughs> what the, what the fuck? I don't know. It's just, it's, this is so milk toast. Even though I think this is petty, there's nothing here. It, it, who fucking cares? ContraPoints didn't like it when Vosh did something that was mean. Vosh knows he was being mean. Of course he knew he was being mean. Did you see that stream? 
Did any of you actually watch? I know you will. I know the people who are mad about this watch that stream. That was the stream where he spent half of it calling people the arsler. So he knows he was being mean. He's a big boy. Like, come on. This is not that big of a deal. I do think it's petty. And for the record, although I know that a whole bunch of you have literally already forgotten what I opened this segment on, but I don't think, I don't think ContraPoints is right about Vosh. I do think Vosh cares a lot about trans rights. In fact, I'm very confident in that. And I'm just a nobody. I'm a small, tiny, by comparison to both of these people, I'm this big, okay? I'm an ant. I get like 450 viewers, which to me is like, wow, that's awesome. I never thought that I would get 450 people watching my streams for hours on end. A little tiny streamer by comparison to both of these people. Um, but, uh, but I don't know. I do think that uh, for what it's worth, I, don't, I, I do think that ContraPoints is being uncharitable and inaccurate and also a little petty, but so is Vosh. Maybe these two can find it in their, their gigantic, uh, uh, gigantic platforms, in their gigantic projects, maybe they can find it within them to move beyond this type of silly pettiness. Because uh, this is really, really embarrassing. Like guys, there are big beefs to be had but this is very personal, very petty, and very embarrassing. It's embarrassing to see everybody freak out about it. It's embarrassing to see uh, this type of point used in a video that's otherwise so serious. There you have it. There's my hot take. Y'all wanted it. Congratulations. You got it. you to publicly shame him though because unlike Vosh I would never sink to that. The point I'm trying to make is I have no qualms about calling out people on my side whenever they go too far or cross a line or do stupid tweets and then mansplain to me about how I don't understand tactical misogyny. Idiot. But the same cannot be said of JK Rowling. I have never once seen her call out any of the bigotry and abusiveness that is absolutely rampant in the gender critical movement. There's a great video called JK Rowling's New Friends by YouTuber Sean that exposes the dishonesty of framing this conflict as meek, concerned feminists versus the abusive trans mob. A framing that the witch trials of JK Rowling accepts uncritically citing numerous examples of death threats and abusiveness from trans advocates. Things like kill TERFs 2014. Sorry, I'm still mad. I'm still mad. I'm still salty. That's right, I'm bitter. I'm bitter and salty. I'm the nasty, bitter and salty trans. Because no matter how reasonable and fair my take is, it won't fucking matter. How about slowly and horrendously murder TERFs in saw-like torture machines and contraptions? Now, I don't think anyone should joke about putting people in saw traps, but also, how serious is this threat that was posted to Tumblr in 2014? Let's use our- You fucking idiots, you fucking idiots will, will screen grab the most negative shit to try and stir drama between content creators that you allegedly like. Uh, you all motherfuckers will grab a offhand comment from some random like three hour deep podcast and send it to somebody just to ignite conflict. You won't fucking send positive shit. You won't build each other up. You won't work with each other. You never fucking do it. Ever. It's just a never ending cycle. I did try to screen grab Demon Mama falling out of her chair to ignite conflict. Okay, that would have been good. That would have been good, though. That's the good type of conflict. Asking in good faith, but do you think that the drama between Contra and Vosh has more to do with them talking past the issues they took with each other? Obviously. It's super obvious. Like, anybody outside of it knows exactly what the fuck is going on. Both of them were mad. Both of them spoke out of turn in certain ways. Like, for example, Vosh 
felt that ContraPoints was being dismissive of his very real complaints. Vosh was getting absolutely pilloried, okay? Listen, listen the fuck up, okay? Vosh was getting fucking pilloried by a complete shithead, JK Rowling. This video is a two hour long video ex ex taking extreme detail to explain how much of a disgusting shithead JK Rowling actually is. Vosh made a joke and JK Rowling, who is nine billion times as big as Vosh will ever be, okay? JK Rowling wrote a book that was translated into more languages than the fucking Bible, okay? And Vosh, felt frustrated because very few people, large creators, came to his aid in that moment. And part of the reason is because he was being very bombastic, which I get that. But at the same time, he wasn't being that bombastic. The joke was not that big of a fucking deal. And, and the worst part is that some people didn't just not support him, which is one thing, but they went out of their way to attack him as if to like disavow him, even though he wasn't doing anything really worse than any of the, any of the things that they do. ContraPoints makes tons of, tons of edgy jokes. All of these people make edgy jokes, but you know, uh, once, because the spotlight was on Vosh, they kind of like d did the denouncing thing, okay? All right. ContraPoints is mad because in his frustration, Vosh basically called for a dog pile. And he, I know that he didn't mean it 100%, but he did. He did basically call for a dog pile. And also he brought up her substance abuse issues in a negative light to a stream of over 10,000 people. These are both very valid things to be frustrated about and none of them have to do with trans rights, and none of them have to do with whether or not JK Rowling is correct or not. None of them have anything to do with politics, and they have everything to do with interpersonal frustrations between content creators who don't really have a very tight connection, but nonetheless are completely capable of having emotions. And it's so fucking frustrating. I don't know. Because people do this shit. There's this whole cycle that happens online that I've talked about a hundred million times to no avail, which is this deranged, parasocial, never-ending uh, churn of people uh, misrepresenting things ever so slightly uh, essentializing, abstracting, and then being complete and utter shitheads to one another. And I'm not trying to take a centrist take here. There are actual really horrible shitty people on the planet. There are really, there are people who do fucking terrible things to one another. You all know I call them out all the time. But this isn't one of them, okay? This is, there is no great political transgression that happened here. This was just poor communication and poor decisions that led to a impasse between two people. And I don't think they have to be friends and I don't think they have to make up. However, this perpetual back and forth is embarrassing. And what's even more embarrassing is the way that fans behave about it. Now, to be fair, you could argue that fans are just following the lead of their respective communities, but we all know that that doesn't perfectly encapsulate the situation in any way, shape, or form. It's not accurate. People do fucking crazy shit all over YouTube and Twitter. Hello, Dale. I don't even remember where I was going. That's humans. Well, I guess we can just shrug our, our, I guess we can just shrug our shoulders and say, well, that's humans, everybody. Uh, none of it matters anyway. Nothing that is said matters, right?
and some people will stand by their deranged characterizations of events. Like, I know this firsthand as somebody who has had an unfucking fathomable amount of hate. You want to talk about totally undue hate? When my channel got like 30 average viewers, I had a community 20 times my size freaking out on me daily. Okay, you want to talk about like uneven? I had like 30 active regular members of my community when a giant ass community started freaking the fuck out on me for like two years straight. And every single day I had to deal with that fucking shit. And you know what? They will come up with the most batshit mental gymnastics to tell you that what you did was uh, you committed a genocide basically. And I hate that shit. I hate it so much. The context collapse never stops. It's like one of the most purely negative things about this space that makes me actually hate this line of work. Thank you. Anyway. Uh... Oh yes, and of course, explicit calls that it would be a good thing for the world, that it would be the right thing to do to, to uh, uh, if I, if I would die and disappear off the internet, okay? That is literally the words that were used against me, okay? Now, let's, can we, can we get back to the video? The rest of this video has been totally fine. The rest of this video has been totally fine. And I would like to enjoy the rest of this video. I would actually like to enjoy the rest of this very well created video, which was great and has been great so far. I do think that this was a petty jab, but I just made my case about that. So I don't think there's anything else I need to say about it. The community wants to see you mauled. I don't know what they want. Honestly, the community wants to see me get mad at Christians. Did you guys know that my video yelling about Christian nationalism has gotten like 18,000 views? Eight fucking 18,000 views in the last like few days. This video won't do that good. Vontix with the $5 says, in my opinion, you and Lance seem to do really well with seeing the bigger picture and letting small stuff go. Why do the big creators not do as well with this? Well, I think they usually do. I think a lot of big creators do do okay with this. You have to remember that I hate to sound like an individualist, but like everybody's their own person. Sometimes people get hurt a little more than you might expect by something. I just wish there was like, I don't know. I, I, I wish there would be a little bit more, just a drop more of sanity about it. I with, wish communities would be just a tiny bit more sane about stuff like this. And I wish that people would be just a tiny bit less petty. I appreciate the compliment a lot, Vontux. Uh, I, I, I take a lot of pains to try and be reasonable. And I don't know if it's always worth it, but I like to think that it is. Slaps hungry bears. You do good work. This kind of stuff is bullshit. Sorry you have to deal with all of it. I don't have to deal with all of it, but I do have to deal with some of it. And I do have to deal with more than I should have to. And also remember, at the end of the day, I always put a little bit of blame on social media itself. Social media... It, 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 it conditions people to behave a certain way. And that, that conditioning gets stronger the larger your following is. The more people you have able to yell at you on a daily basis, the more likely you are to fall, fall into the, like, the, 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 the twisted machinations of social media. Social media in its current state, Facebook, Twitter, even YouTube, is so toxic. It's so messed up. Anyway, let's continue the video. Let's continue. Thank you, good for Gabby. It's very kind of you. Also, just a little pat, just so I'll pat myself on the back. 
Talk about transformative reacts. You never have watched a react stream as original as mine, okay? I'm the like primary pause Andrea. I add a joke every five seconds. I have a, a tangent that I go off, random funny things. Fucking good at this shit. You all know it. And I deserve more subscribers. Let's go. Critical thinking skills here. Do you think that Jigsaw, the villain from the Saw movies, has a Tumblr account and is threatening turfs? Or do you think this was posted by a 14 year old? The podcast cites zero examples of death threats and abusiveness from anti-trans bigots. And it's not exactly like you have to dig deep to find any. I can fill the screen up with examples just from people who JK Rowling has explicitly supported or interacted with. I will drive you out into the desert and bury you nine feet down, one tweet says from a fan of JK Rowling. First, I'll set you on fire and piss on your half alive corpse. Fuck trans activism. Fuck gender ideology and fuck you. Another threat from the same user is so graphically violent and sexual, I don't know if I can even read it aloud without violating the YouTube terms of service. But threats like this from the gender critical side are simply not mentioned in the witch trials of JK Rowling. Both Rowling and Megan seem happy to cherry pick threatening tweets Hell and yeah, sound Dagmar. bites of Great shouting protesters. Fuck you, you ugly piece of shit. You look like you got your teeth knocked out, you fucking fascist. As evidence that the trans movement is dangerous and insidious to the core. But this exact technique has been used against literally every liberation movement in world history. For example, Let's consider Reclaim the Night, the protest movement against sexual violence in Britain, which first got JK Rowling interested in feminism in the 1970s. Here's how The Guardian, Britain's spineless centrist paper of note, covered a Reclaim the Night protest in 1979. Chanting slogans against rape seems reasonable to promote awareness, but what about the hissing and swearing at any innocent male and cries of castrate men? We were all sympathetic to the principles of the women's liberation movement, but we left the crowd of shouting, torch-bearing women when it became clear that my friend's brother was running the risk of personal mutilation if he remained with us. The protesters were allegedly singing, Here I stand, my knife in hand, free castration on demand. So this is how the British press covered the women's movement. Angry, torch-bearing women screaming, Castrate men! Now, is that a fair representation of the women's movement? Should we judge every movement by its most militant extremists? Is it fair, say, to pretend that Valerie Solanus, who shot Andy Warhol, who advocated for male extermination in her society for cutting up men manifesto is representative of feminism as a whole many hey this is a topic i've talked about recently i've talked very recently about how annoyed i get that the left is so cucked the right wing will literally stand by their most extreme and deranged advocates and the left wing will denounce like every person who dresses up in black for for a protest the, the, the left has the least giga chad that you can possibly imagine and it makes me so angry. It's like one of the most cucked things. So one of the things nobody talks about is how the online left specifically completely sells out all of their actual activists, even the ones who didn't do anything wrong. The online left is so fucking obsessed with optics that they'll be like, even when a trans woman is literally assaulted on video, they will get mad and denounce her because she fought back. Fucking embarrassing. Fucking embarrassing. Cucked. Have a spine. Stand up for the people who are actually saving the fucking planet. I'm not saying you have to defend every single action from every single lefty, but holy fucking shit. Don't fucking sell out because of fucking baby-brained optics bullshit to the fucking people who want to put you in a gas chamber for fuck's sake. We need to get re- GET REAL! GET REAL! You think you can have a social movement on your phone? GET REAL! The anti-feminists over the years have done exactly that. But it's not fair. Is it? So why does JK Rowling think it's fair to judge the trans movement by the worst things trans people have ever tweeted? I want her to choke on my fat trans dick. And I 
made excuses for you then. In the fourth episode of The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, Megan interviews New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg, who has written sympathetically about transphobic feminism. There's a moment in this interview where Michelle kind of stumbles into an honest observation that I find fascinating. Right, I mean, I think you'll often hear people say, you know, I'm not going to debate my basic humanity. And, and part of the difficulty is that there are indeed certain issues which we have sort of decided somewhat collectively with some sort of consensus are beyond the realm of, of debate. And I think that part of what is so difficult about this issue is that there are certain people who think that this kind of consensus can be imposed maybe as opposed to evolve organically. And so they're sort of desperately trying to shore it up in the hopes, I think, that if they can, they will enjoy the same sort of assumed protection as other groups whose rights we've decided are not up for public conversation. I think the problem is that we don't actually have a consensus. So Michelle correctly observes that the reason trans people are often reluctant to debate our rights is that we want the same assumed protections as other groups whose rights liberals have decided are not up for debate. But then, Michelle suggests that trans people have True, to debate LB. our rights because there isn't a mainstream consensus that we deserve rights. I am really curious to know how Michelle Goldberg thinks that past liberation movements have succeeded. Like, does she think that women's suffrage just evolved organically? Did suffragettes just have calm, civil conversations about whether women are intellectually capable of voting until all the misogynists were rationally persuaded? No, they stood up and demanded their their right to vote, sometimes violently, especially in the UK. Like, people forget this, maybe because they were called suffragettes, which is kind of a cutesy name, but the suffragettes, they murdered people. They were suffragette terrorists. They broke windows, they bombed churches, they set fire to a theater. In 1909, a suffragette attacked Winston Churchill with a horse whip. Queen oh, shit, honestly. So the English suffragette Mary Lee threw a fucking hatchet at I the- I mean, I disavow, I disavow. Oh, I disavow, bad optics, bad optics. Oh. Prime Minister's head. And my point is not to advocate terrorism or to excuse the terrorism of past movements. I think these kinds of tactics have tended to turn people against the movement. I don't think it's effective. But let's not pretend that past movements have never made demands before everyone was ready. Because there never has been and there never will be a time when everyone is ready. I mean, Mary Wollstonecraft published The Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792. And misogyny, in case you hadn't noticed, remains rampant. So there never has been a consensus about women's rights, and there probably never will be. In fact, marginalized groups wouldn't need rights if there was a consensus that we deserve rights. The whole reason to have rights is to protect you from the kind of people who think you shouldn't have them. I mean, it's a nice thought that we can just politely persuade everyone to give us rights, but the reality is, that's not how this works, and it never has been. Like, how do these debate me centrists think that slavery ended in the United States? Well, between 1861 and 1865, there was a little event called the American Civil Debate. See what I'm holding in my hand? This is a high caliber idea that I picked off the polite discussion field of Manassas. Do you people think that American schools were integrated because all the white people in the South were persuaded that segregation is bad? No dum-dums. Eisenhower had to send in the 101st Airborne to enforce that shit at gunpoint. And my point is not to equate LGBT rights movements with black civil rights. I am aware that being a white queer person is not in any way equivalent to living in the aftermath of slavery. I'm just saying that there's this tendency to sanitize history and to imagine that progress was smooth and bloodless, that consensus evolved organically, when it just didn't. Nope, and then people get the impression that current movements are somehow more militant than successful past movements when they just aren't. I am fighting what I see as a powerful, insidious, misogynistic movement, the cultural movement that was illiberal in its methods. And I believe absolutely that there is something dangerous about this movement, and it must be challenged. <sighs> Why is J.K. Rowling like this? Chapter 7. Why is J.K. Rowling like this? J.K. Rowling loves to quote radical feminist Andrea Dworkin, whom I've already mentioned a couple times in this video. I myself favor violence. Deeply. I favor it. Dworkin is known- Dworkin, by the way, is insanely based. 
And if you don't believe me, I highly recommend reading any of Dworkin's work because you will find it highly inspiring. Uh, Dworkin gets shit on all the time for absolutely no reason. Dworkin is insanely based. No joke. And also her books are really easy to read. They're very short and they're very easy to read. She's mostly taken completely out of context. Even I've made this mistake. She was explicitly trans supportive. Wasn't Dworkin a swerf? Not, okay, yes and no. Some people will characterize Dw Dworkin as a swerf, but uh, Dworkin never, like, Dworkin had very large critiques for pornography and sex work as a whole. N no actual real attacks against sex workers, and she always supported uh, basically any policy that would protect and empower the sex workers themselves. But she did write a lot of criticisms about pornography and a lot of criticisms about sex work, which leads to some people concluding that she's a swerf, but I don't believe that that's an accurate characterization of her. I, I genuinely don't think that's accurate. Anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. For her extreme sex negative views, which I don't agree with, but she was an interesting writer, one of those half crazed savants who gets in your head, who you can't stop thinking about. In my opinion, Dworkin's best book is Right Wing Women, published in- My partner read me a whole bunch of this book and it's fucking incredible. This book right here, we have a copy that looks exactly like this. 1983, the era of Phyllis Schlafly and Anita Bryant. Right Wing Women is an analysis of why so many women are drawn to conservative politics, seemingly against their own interests. Anyone who's interested in understanding the gender critical movement, a crypto reactionary backlash disguising itself as feminism, should read this book. In Dworkin's analysis, the political right makes certain metaphysical and material promises to women that both exploit and quiet some of women's deepest fears. No one can bear to live a meaningless life. Women fight for meaning just as women fight for survival. And conservative politics promises women meaning. The right offers women a simple, fixed, predetermined social, biological, and sexual order. Form conquers chaos. Form banishes confusion. The gender critical movement offers women a brutally simple understanding of sex and gender. A woman is an adult human female. Right wing anti-trans activist Posey Parker has made this phrase into the motto of the gender critical movement. Adult human female. It's on billboards, it's on t-shirts, it's on banners, signs, and tweets. Presented with the authority of a dictionary definition, it's rigid, it's orderly, it's immutable. There are no exceptions, there are no blurred lines, there can be no change. This mantra is a defense against the conceptual instability and chaos that gender criticals fear. The same fear that once drove homophobic women like Anita Bryant. Erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. Dworkin says, Within the frame of male domination, there is a good reason for women to hate homosexuality, both male and female. Women are interchangeable as sex objects. Women are slightly less disposable as mothers. The only dignity and value women get is as mothers. Having children is the one social contribution credited to women. It is the bedrock of women's social worth. Without childbearing, women know they have nothing. Homosexuality for women means having nothing. It means extinction. Substitute transgenderism for homosexuality, and you'll understand the gender critical movement. J.K. Rowling's definition of woman is this. The woman is um, the producer of the large gametes. The producer of the large gametes. Rowling says her primary concern about young trans men is the loss of fertility. Homosexuality, its rise in public visibility, attempts to socially legitimize or protect it, makes women expendable. The one thing women can do and be valued for will no longer be valued. Male homosexuality is especially terrifying because it suggests a world without women altogether, a world in which women are extinct. 
This exact fear appears frequently in gender critical rhetoric. Trans activists are erasing women. They're erasing biological sex. They're going to call Constantly us pregnant us. people. Confused girls are being robbed of their precious fertility. Trans women are going to replace biological women. As a woman, I feel threatened because biological men are aggressively replacing women. You will not replace us! Sometimes this paranoia ramps up to the point of obsession, and the results can be dazzling. In September 2022, Maya Forstadter, who you'll remember as the anti-trans activist whom JK Rowling came out as a turf to defend, went on a full-blown Twitter rampage because the Hertfordshire County Libraries announced they were changing their children's storytime mascot from the Bookstart Bear. If you don't know where this is going, strap in from the Bookstart Bear to a bright, vibrant, gender-neutral creature called Tala. Are you in- I love that little alien. I absolutely love the design of that cute little alien. Raged? <laughs> if not, you haven't been spending enough time on mum's net. Maya tweeted the words of an indignant mother who referred to Talia, wait, wasn't it Tala? Referring to Talia as a trans bear with they, them pronouns, describing the mascot as ideological, creepy, and gaslighting. I cannot express how upset I feel. The library jumped in to- They're just annoying. Conservatives are just fucking insufferable. They're mad about literally everything. They're the most triggered people on the planet. They make your life annoying. They ruin your family dinners. They make it so you can't just enjoy your time with your partner. Holy shit. To clarify that Tala, not Talia, isn't trans, they are an alien. Maya then demanded to know how this alien was birthed. Did it hatch from an egg or was it born from a mama? Some people tried to reason with Maya. There's an advantage in having a character that isn't identifiably male or female, as it can be equally relatable to either sex and avoid promoting gender stereotypes. But Maya was not convinced. It seems highly unlikely that an alien that had evolved with such recognizable vertebrate body plan is not sexually reproducing. It's a relatable anthropomorphic character, not a slime mold. I need to know how the alien fucks right now. I said I need to know how the alien fucks before I can show it to my child. That right there. This image sums up the entirety of the turf movement. Right there. Bing! The ma the biggest nerd emoji. Ah! You you can't get rid of the bookstart bear! You can't replace it with an alien! An alien that doesn't have a gender! Well how will I know if it's sexy? How will I know if it lays an egg? Ah! Bing! Failed. <laughs> When Twitter understandably laughed it up at Maya's expense, she just kept posting. <laughs> and she posted hard. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone post so hard. In a lengthy diatribe, Maya wrote about the miseries of new motherhood. You are in charge of a baby. You have never done this before. You haven't had a good night's sleep for months and won't for years. Everyone has an opinion on what you are doing right and wrong, and you've become invisible. True, Gayfesh. Jordan Peterson does post harder. And politics. You had a career. You had interests. You had a sex life. Now, you have the daily needs of a completely dependent person, and your world has shrunk. The fact that these men, and the young women that cheer them on, think this is so laughable reflects society's disdain for mothers. This is what it means to say a woman is not a feeling or a costume. This is why the hub of the resistance is on mum's net. Oh, so yeah, totally. I am fascinated by this thread. I think it's one of the most revealing texts in gender critical history, because you know what? Maya Forstetter actually does have valid concerns, but the concerns she has that are valid have nothing to do with trans people, and they definitely have nothing to do with an adorable cartoon alien. <laughs> Honestly, reading this, I have some concerns. Concerns like, where is Maya's husband? 
I know she has one. Isn't raising children supposed to be a mutual project? No one should have to feel this alone, raising children. That is a valid concern. Oh my god, we actually found one. It's like finding El Dorado. A valid concern. A valid concern. Isn't what's going on here that Maya is taking legitimate feelings of being overburdened and underappreciated and displacing those feelings onto transgender people? This is exactly how the gender critical movement recruits, by providing a scapegoat to frustrated women. It's not your husband's neglect, it's not the increasing atomization of society, it's not the indignities of aging, it's Tala, the non-binary alien, with its dungarees and smug aura of gender neutrality. Mum's net is the hub of the resistance. <laughs> to non-binary cartoons. It's too much. These people are too much. Okay, we have to be serious now. The political right also promises women safety and security. For women, the world is a very dangerous place. The right acknowledges the reality of danger, the validity of fear. The right then manipulates the fear. Women fear night, and resent Dagmar. male violence, for being which they're most likely to experience from the men closest to them boyfriends, husbands, and fathers. They're most likely to be killed by sexual partners. But the need to survive in a male-dominated society means that women's legitimate fears and resentments often cannot be directed at well, the men you, with Gumball. power. Inevitably, this causes women to take the rage and contempt they feel for the men who actually abuse them, those close to them, and project it onto others, those far away, foreign, or different. And yep. See, I told you, Right Wing Women is a fucking very interesting uh, book. And this displacement of rage is just transparently what's going on with J.K. Rowling. In her essay about sex and gender issues, Rowling speculates True, though, that yeah. trans men are transitioning to be the son her father wanted. I really felt the rejection of my father, and that is one of the things that maybe leads someone going into homosexuality. And she describes the lingering trauma what? from her first violent marriage. The marriage at this point has turned very violent and very controlling. And that, she says, is why she decided to speak out against the transgender movement. If you try to- Nutt says, uh, instead of calling out actual abusers, right-wing women will shit on all men. That's something that can happen, but also they sometimes will like fixate on Muslim men or black men or trans women who they think are men. That's something that's, that's kind of, and keep in mind, Andrea Dworkin was writing about this way before this particular uh, chapter of the struggle. Yeah. I understand this rationally. It looks like a total non sequitur, but if you look at it emotionally, there's a kind of logic to it. The existence of the dangerous outsider always functions for women simultaneously as deception, diversion, painkiller, and threat. Women cling to irrational hatreds focused particularly on the unfamiliar so that they will not murder their fathers, husbands, sons, brothers, lovers, the men with whom they are intimate, those who do hurt them. In the 1970s, many conservative women displaced this rage onto lesbians, the threatening outsider of the day. Dworkin attended the National Women's Conference in 1977, where she spoke to a lot of women about their fear of lesbians. Right-wing women consistently spoke to me about lesbians as if lesbians were rapists, certified committers of sexual assault against women and girls. To them, the lesbian was inherently monstrous, experienced almost as a demonic sexual force hovering closer and closer. She was the dangerous intruder, encroaching, threatening by her very presence a sexual order that cannot bear scrutiny or withstand challenge. Is almost Punk Corp said, God, I didn't know how entirely based Dworkin was. Seriously, all of you in chat who are hearing this, just go download off the internet a copy of Right Wing Women. Unironically, just go do it. You can read it. It's a tiny little book. Go download it and read it and you will feel smarter. I'm not kidding you. Dworkin was a... Even if you don't agree with everything that Dworkin says, Dworkin was an incredibly intelligent writer and made very compelling and informed arguments, and you will probably benefit from them. Seriously. It's surreal to read this because of how 
Precisely, it describes how gender criticals talk about trans women. Pronouns are like rohypnol. They dull your defenses. They change your inhibitions. They're meant to. Now it's true what? that trans exclusionary radical feminism began as an offshoot of far left lesbian separatism, with academic feminist Janice Raymond writing in 1979 that transsexualism should be morally mandated out of existence. But the gender critical movement was always destined to become a right wing movement because it has the structure of a right wing movement. It does, Taking yep. women's Down to the fear very and basic. rage toward familiar men and displacing it onto an unfamiliar outsider. The momentum behind this is just too ripe an opportunity for conservatives to pass up. As Dworkin says, Because women so displace their rage, they are easily controlled and manipulated haters. Women require symbols of danger that justify their fear. The right provides these symbols of danger by designating clearly defined groups of outsiders as sources of danger. In the 2020s, anti-trans bigotry has become a keystone of conservative party platforms, both in the UK, where Lee Anderson, deputy chair of the Conservative Party, predicts that the next election will be won on probably a, cult, a mixture of culture wars and trans debate. And in the US, where the ACLU is currently tracking more than 450 anti-LGBT bills, including more than 130 gender-affirming care bans, 51 trans sports bans, 40 drag bans, 29 trans bathroom bans, and 21 bans defining trans people out of the law. Republicans have escalated anti-trans rhetoric to eliminationist extremes that have most trans people in this country living in a constant state of fear for our future. Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The left is attacking our children, pushing sex talk, transgender extremism, and noxious politics in our schools. We should reject this demonic assault on the innocence of our children. This guy literally looks like he's wearing a skin suit. There are holes cut in the skin suit for his eyes. Every single conservative, they all look like shambling husks. They're Dark Souls enemies. Children and stand fast against leftist efforts to mutilate their bodies and minds. Stop confusing our babies with your groomer gender ideologue. I will revoke every Biden policy promoting the chemical castration and sexual mutilization <laughs> of our youth. Mutilization. <laughs> and ask Congress to send me a bill prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. On day one, I will revoke Joe Biden's cruel policies on so-called gender-affirming care. Ridiculous. I will sign a new executive order instructing every federal agency to cease all programs that promote the concept of sex and gender transition oh, absolutely. at any age. A few gender criticals still want to insist they have nothing to do with right-wing anti-trans bigots, like Helen Lewis. I mean, turf is basically witch. Who attempts in her interview in the witch trials of JK Rowling to distinguish between the transphobia of the far right and that of feminists. I think the hardest thing for outsiders to understand is that there are two different arguments going on. One is the traditional conservative right argument, which is anti-LGBT. The other one is a criticism from the left, in which it says, sometimes male people and female people have different interests, no matter how the male people identify. But as a trans person, I don't care whether you justify your transphobia in the name of protecting women or protecting children. Whether it's radical feminist Janice Raymond calling for transsexualism to be morally mandated out of existence, or conservative Catholic Michael Knowles calling for transgenderism to be eradicated from public life, it's the same repulsive bigotry to me. And in any case, the gender critical movement has recently reached an implicit consensus that they're mostly done pretending to be feminist. The rising star of the movement, Posey Parker, aka Kelly J. Keene Minchel, rejects feminism entirely. 
Do you call yourself a feminist now? No. Did no. you ever call yourself a feminist? I probably did for a short time. But so you wouldn't be said like a Julie Bindle type feminist? No, or? well, some feminists. I mean, Julie Bindle has been critical of um, mothers in the past, and I think that's a, that's a theme flowing through feminism. I'm not a feminist! I'm not a feminist! This is not Andrea Dworkin. This is Phyllis Schlafly. Parker's campaign is currently funded by the right-wing CPAC. CPAC came along and said that they would sponsor our events and cover all of our mm. insurance throughout our whole trip. Damn, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money coming in from those giant conservative funds. Almost like these people are, enti their entire careers are being summoned directly out of the money that circles around the rich conservatives in America, literally. Can you imagine? Oh my God. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you uh, imagine how different the world would be if there was any of that sort of energy around the left? If leftists could be supported to that degree, even a fraction of that degree, these fucking oil barons will summon these homunculuses out of the dust. Which is really kind of them. Um, but what we would need to do is we would need to show that we were working for them, working with them. She has no qualms about collaborating with far-right white nationalists. I want to talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Let me tell you what she's been saying. She's a Republican, but she, uh, I agree with her wholeheartedly. She's opposed abortion and contraception for teenagers. Why are we enabling um, children to take... Um, sometimes contraceptives that, that are quite harmful or access to abortion. Um, I think that we really need to rethink all of this. I think parents need to take back control of their children. She's called trans people fools and perverts. Transgenderism is nuts. It's for fools and perverts. She's denied that transgender is a legitimate concept. It's not a real thing. There's no such thing as being born in the wrong body. There's no such thing as a trans woman. There's no such thing as a trans person. There is no such thing. There are people that call themselves these things that may have other issues manifesting that then make them think they're this, but no, we have to stop using any words like transgender. Um, you know, there may be more words that we have to say in order to say that. We may call it transgender ideology, uh, but when it comes to a person, they may be following transgender ideology, but they are not transgender. There is no such thing as a man or a woman being anything other than a man or a woman. She's called trans women pedophiles. We know that if a man has a paraphilia of dressing as a woman, the most likely cross paraphilia is paedophilia. We know that these men have multiple paraphilias. They don't ever stop at one. She's said that each and every woman who stands in her way will be annihilated. Each and every uh, one of you women who stand in my way, each and every one of you, let me just tell you, you will be annihilated. She's called on armed men to enter women women's restrooms to attack anyone they perceive as not a real woman. And men, for once, I'm talking to you. I'm talking about you dads who maybe carry, I think that's what you say. Uh, I'm so down with the American lingo. Maybe you carry, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you consider yourself a protector of women. Maybe you're that sort of man. Um, maybe you have a daughter or a mother or a wife. Uh, maybe you have a sister. Maybe you just have some friends. Maybe you just think women are human and you don't need any absolute connection with them to feel compelled to protect us. Um, I think you should start using women's toilets, men. And she said... Just remember, these are the people who are crying victims. Do you guys remember when... Uh... Do you guys remember when just like a few like a few weeks ago Charlie Kirk was talking about how um he believes that we should bring back lynchings for trans people? Just remember what these people are on about. Just remember what they're explicitly advocating for. They sometimes dance around it, they say it really slowly and they pick their words very carefully. But think about what they're actually advocating advocating for. Just remember that every single time you hear them cry victim, every single time you hear them claim that they're the really, they're the most persecuted ones. Just remember what they want. 
that women who call themselves men should be sterilized, which seems to be a little bit in tension with J.K. Rowling's concern about the fertility of confused girls. You know, you might look at these differences of opinion between Rowling and Parker, little things like pro-feminist versus anti-feminist, left versus right, pro-abortion versus anti-abortion, concern about trans men's fertility versus advocating forced sterilization of trans men, against annihilating women who stand in your way versus pro-annihilating each and every woman who stands in your way. You might look at these differences and expect that these two women would be at odds, but they aren't. Because promoting anti-trans bigotry is a common cause that for both of them trumps all else. In 2020, Posey Parker paid for a poster reading I Heart J.K. Rowling to be displayed at a railway station in Edinburgh, and Rowling has tweeted in defense of Parker numerous times and has modeled mm. her t-shirts. So, the gender critical movement, started by lesbian separatists in the 1970s, has finally passed into the hands of pound shop Ava Browns, as gender critical lesbian Julie Bindle memorably described them. It's a movement that has no beliefs apart from a shared determination to reduce the number of trans people. In the numbers we're currently seeing, particularly of young people coming forward, I find cause for doubt. Yes. In the meantime, while we're, while we're trying to get through to the decision makers, we have to try to limit the harm. And that means reducing or keeping down the number of people who transition. And that's for two reasons. One of them is that every one of those people is a person who's been damaged. But the second one is every one of those people is basically, you know, a huge problem to a sane world. Like if you've got people, that, and whether they're transitioned, whether they're happily transitioned, whether they're... A huge problem to a sane world. Hmm. Unhappily transitioned, whether they're detransitioned. If you've got people who've dissociated from their sex in some way, every one of those people is someone who needs special accommodation in a sane world where we re-acknowledge the, the truth of sex. So to wrap this up, is the backlash against J.K. Rowling a witch hunt? Unequivocally, no. It's very thoroughly deserved. But I will say this. A movement can't get along without a devil. And across the whole political spectrum, there's a misogynistic tendency to choose a female devil. Whether it's Anita Bryant, Hillary Clinton, Marie Antoinette, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or J.K. Rowling. And there's always going to be people who seize on any opportunity to be misogynistic. Oh, no. So Why would you I would advise so trans cringe. people and our allies to keep in mind that JK Rowling is not the final boss of transphobia. She's not our devil. The devil is the Republican Party, the conservative party. The devil is patriarchy. It's the right wing men yeah. who will be the ones to put gender critical. I don't I don't disagree with that message. Uh, I just I'll talk about this in a minute. Theory we'll get there. Into brutal practice. Anita Bryant, Posey Parker, and J.K. Rowling are, to borrow a term from TERFs, handmaidens. TERFs are the real handmaidens. They're useful idiots who put a concerned female face on the patriarchal violence against trans people that will ultimately be enacted by right-wing men. I call on men to consider themselves decent human beings to call out the deviants among them and eradicate these monsters from society. And Woo! Yikers! Megan Phelps Roper and centrist Slaker are wrong that civil conversation can resolve this. Call out the deviants among them and eradicate these monsters from society. People like Michael Knowles and Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump cannot be persuaded. They have to be defeated. As for what to do True. about J.K. Rowling, honestly, let's all just block her. Open up Twitter right now, go to her profile, and just block her. Problem solved. Like, don't harass her, that doesn't help. But also, I wouldn't wait for her to change. She's gone down what I call the bigotry whirlpool. The deeper you go in, the harder it is to leave. For the same reasons that it's hard to quit a cult or scam. To quote video essayist Dan Olson, One of the most insidious elements of a confidence scam is that the victims who invested the most are often the most passionate defenders.
genders, because shame is a powerful force in the human psyche, and they can't bear the shame of admitting they were tricked. Reformed bigots have to face not only the shame of being dupes, but also the guilt of having devoted years of life to harming vulnerable people. This is something Megan, to her credit, faced head on. If we were wrong, then I had spent every day of my life industriously sowing doom, discord, and rage to so many not at the behest of God, but of my grandfather. I had wasted my life only to fill others with pain and misery. Yep. Most bigots cannot stand to face this yep. moral sunk cost. It's why an obsessive bigot like Graham Linehan, whose all-consuming hatred of trans people has ruined his life, cost him his marriage, and left him alone to tweet about destroying gender ideology minutes before midnight on New Year's Eve, feels psychologically compelled to insist with ever more certainty that trans people are not just delusional or dangerous, but are all demonic perverts, an enemy so hyperbolically evil that they justify his self-immolating crusade. They took everything from me, you know. They took my, they took my, my family, you know. And I just said, no, hang on a sec. Stop calling these women TERFs. Stop sending them abuse. You did that, bro. You did that. Let them speak. Blubbering. And for that, pathetic. They, they just destroyed me. Do you honestly feel destroyed? No, because, because the one thing about this, the one thing about this that keeps me going is that I know I'm right, you know? I know I'm right. As long as he stays here, in the bottom of the whirlpool, he never has to face that he's ruined his relationships and wasted years of life because he just couldn't let it go. And if JK Rowling doesn't log off soon, this will likely be her fate as well. Unfortunately, it already is. She's already in league with Nazis. It's, that is her fate. There is no, she's not going to come back from this. She's in league. She's wearing the shirt of a person who gladly embraces anti-feminist rhetoric, who gladly embraces eliminationist rhetoric. It's, it's, it's done. I guess what I'm really trying to say is, Harry Potter's dead to me. I'm switching to Twilight. All right. All right. So final thoughts on the video. Uh, I liked the video. I thought it was very good. Um, I, uh, I think it was incredibly well argued, very, very well sourced. There was a lot to go through here. It was a really, really, really major transphobia download. I gotta say, uh, I spent the last four and a half hours uh, reacting to this thing, and it was a bombardment of endless transphobia. Um, however, I don't think it was a, like, hopeless meth uh, uh, message. Uh, the Vosh stuff under... I, I, I mean this 100%. If there's any one takeaway, I know that there's next to, next to no chance that Natalie would ever see anything that I've made. It's just an almost 0% chance. Um, but if Natalie was to see anything, this video was very good. This video is fantastic. I really liked it. It reminded me of of the old ContraPoint stuff that, that, uh, that I always felt extremely, was very, very useful and very inspiring. Um, and that's not to say the new stuff. I love the new stuff too. Just the old stuff was something that, that was always very informative and valuable to me. And uh, but the the Vosh petty digs actually undermine the message. It uh, it felt out of place, and it feels very petty. It doesn't align with the other people that you're talking about. Um, like one tweet from Vosh when you're talking about literal Nazis and JK Rowling and eliminationists just feels very out of place and it does undermine the message. Um, I can completely understand being frustrated at things that Vosh does, um, but I don't know if this is the way to work it out. It kind of takes away from the importance of the message going on here in a way that's not like funny, it's not like the jokes or anything, it's just very weird. 
and unfortunate. Um, but also, guys, really isn't that big of a deal. Uh, I think that the strategic miscommunication of like fixating on the weird Vosh tweets uh, is bigger than any sort of personal slight or whatever, but I don't know. I'm not involved, not directly involved in any way. So uh, hopefully this will be the end of that beef. It's the dumbest beef. I hope it stops. It's very silly. Um, I really like this video a lot, and I think it was very valuable. I think it has a lot of actually very useful arguments and does an incredibly good job of what I think video, like video essays that are highly political in nature can do, which is it inoculates people to these to these re, to this rhetoric. It gives people tools meaningfully to resist this rhetoric and to help others resist this rhetoric. And I think that's very very valuable. Unironically, I think that's super 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 valuable. Um, so I gotta say, despite small issues with it. I think this video is really great. I think it looked good, sounded good, it was funny, it was informative. I really liked it. Um, and uh, also, obviously, a lot of people are gonna see this. Uh, if you enjoyed watching this, by the way, not that ContraPoints really needs any help, but uh, just make sure that you go over and throw some likes and subscriptions and comments onto ContraPoints videos. And if you enjoyed watching it with me, please leave Demon Mama a like, subscription, and a comment. Please leave me some comments. I would love to see our community grow. I had a fun time overall reacting to this video. And uh, I would love it if you shared the love. And uh, also, uh, if you're one of the people who shared around clips of the ContraPoint stuff and and wanted there to be conflict and whatever, maybe consider sharing my clip around. The clip of me explaining my frustration with the situation, with the way that people act around these types of dramas. Because I think I made a good case and I think I made a good point. So, yeah. All that would be very cool of you to do.